Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a Justice Committee debate on motion number 11695 in the name of Christine Graham on Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. Could I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to uh, press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Christine Graham to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Justice Committee. Ten minutes, please, Ms Graham. Thank you, Deputy. I have just uh, put uh, Mr Reedy's gas at a peep by telling him I'm actually opening in something. But of course, I'm opening this debate on behalf of the Justice Committee, and I would like to say, therefore, that my speech will be measured, which is perhaps not my usual tenor. I'm pleased that with human rights on our remit, yet again I see the Cabinet Secretary in front of us uh, for social justice, so I don't know if we're going to continue in this role, but never mind. The Justice Committee agreed to engage with Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights, or SNAP, to give it its snappy title, the clerk put that bit in. I was glad when we appointed John Finney as rapporteur to the SNAP process, and I'm delighted we have secured this debate on SNAP's first annual report, and John will be summing up on behalf of the committee. Let me start by emphasising that human rights is not something separate or academic or something to concern us only in countries where we consider rightly or wrongly that these are abused. Human rights, the founding principles, for example, of that right to dignity, should permeate all areas of Scottish life and especially our public services. That's why the, leadership, the membership of the leadership's panel is as it is. For example, and at random, a former convener of the SCVO, Chief Executive of Care Inspectorate, John Scott, QC, VC Justice Scotland, Chair of the Scottish uh, Refugee Council, Chair of Engender, Deputy Chief Constable of Police Scotland, Deputy General Secretary of the S2UC, the Director of Integration and Development at COSLA and others, but across the range of the public services are part of that leadership panel. Based on evidence gathered over a three-year period, the SNAP process was launched on 10 December 2013, International Human Rights Day. It sets out a framework of shared responsibilities and steps to address gaps in good practice. It has been described as a roadmap. Again, not my words. I find metaphorical roadmaps and landscapes cluttered or otherwise cliches a step too far. However, a roadmap, in quotes, for the realisation of all internationally recognised human rights. The SNAP vision is of a Scotland in which everyone is able to live with human dignity. I'm sure that's a vision we all share. In responding to the current political and economic context in Scotland, the SNAP process pursues three outcomes, supported by nine priorities, and these outcomes are better culture, better lives and a better world. It promotes a human rights-based approach, emphasising participation, accountability, non-discrimination, empowerment and legality, PANEL, yet another acronym. This has pro several proven benefits, upholding the rights of everyone, supporting person-centred person services, <coughs> helping good decision-making, improving institutional cultural relationships and finally ensuring legal compliance and promoting best practice. Let's take helping good decision making, for example, as the report says, putting people at the heart of decisions where the impact of a decision on people's rights is properly assessed before it's made. So that, for example, policies like the bedroom tax, manifestly unfair and disproportionate on vulnerable and disabled people will not, as the report says, get off the starting blocks. Now, these are progressive yet challenging outcomes. To achieve them, the SNAP process is overseen by a leadership panel, which I've given you some of the names of, chaired by Professor Alan Miller. There are 26 leaders from the different sectors across the whole spectrum of public life, including the legal profession. Professor Miller told us, the Justice Committee, that there are over 40 organisations playing a role in implementing SNAP. The panel receives regular reports from a number of action groups, which in turn include representation from different sectors. Now to the annual report, which I have in my hand, and an excellent production. Is and Alison uh, John, was quite right in saying that, in fact, Alison McInnes is saying it's a well-presented report that you can actually read and doesn't put you to sleep, is properly presented and easily understandable. So congratulations whoever did that. They know how to make a report informative, understandable, as well as attractive. 
It reflects in successes in year one, such as the Glasgow Commonwealth Games becoming the first Games to have a human rights policy and the commitment that SNAP has achieved from partners to embed human rights into the integration of health and social care across Scotland. We all know of cases where perhaps in particular elderly people or vulnerable people are not given the dignity they deserve in some of our social and health services. The report also describes challenges that are likely to be faced by SNAP in year two, such as increasing people's understanding of their human rights and their participation in decisions that affect them, increasing organisations' ability to put these rights into practice, and increasing accountability through human rights-based laws, governance and monitoring. Professor Miller told the Justice Committee that will include implementing the Scottish Human Rights Commission's Action Plan on Justice for Victims of Historic Abuse of Children in Care, after and reviewing the first couple of years of Police Scotland from a human rights perspective, so challenges lie ahead. As the Justice Committee, we've engaged with the SNAP process by appointing John Finney, I've already referred to, as our rapporteur. Mr Finney receives an update from Professor Miller twice a year and reports back to the committee. And we are also, as you can see, sponsoring this debate. The committee and the Justice Subcommittee in Policing have also sought to promote human rights principles in our day-to-day -day work. For example, in considering the Victims and Witnesses Bill, we had to balance the protection of witnesses, in particular vulnerable witnesses, and often the alleged victim, against the rights of the accused to presumption of innocence, to be convicted on evidence beyond reasonable doubt with the onus on the Crown to establish that guilt. How far, for example, should a vulnerable witness be protected from robust questioning? The subcommittee also scrutinised Police Scotland over inappropriate use of stop and search because these are issues of infringement of civil liberties. This led to change. More recently, last Tuesday, the Justice Committee took evidence on the Scottish Government's changes to the arrangements for inspection, monitoring and visiting of prisons. We had evidence about, for example, compliance with OPCAT. That's the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. And we'll pursue these issues with the Cabinet Secretary when we hear from him on the 16th December. I put him on notice. Whether it's protecting access to legal aid, a fair hearing, a right to freedom of movement or expression balanced as ever against individual responsibilities in a democratic country, our human rights and those of our neighbours and communities permeates every corner of our lives. We often take them for granted until these are threatened, eroded or even withdrawn. We should always be on red alert about protecting those rights and the rights of others. So if and when anyone asks, when does the Parliament consider human rights issues? Or more particularly, when does the Justice Committee consider them? I would reply, all the time. Because, of course, access to justice, whether civil or criminal, is at the core of a civilised justice process. But as a committee, we are also a critical friend of the SNAP <coughs> process and perform a scrutiny role. That's why our rapporteur is not a member of the leadership panel. Whilst noticing the achievements of year one, we also note that there is work to be done as the report acknowledges. We will continue to scrutinise the leadership panel and hold them to account for delivery of the SNAP objectives through the work of our rapporteur, through evidence sessions and through debates like this. Through our rapporteur, we also champion human rights in this parliament and continually think of ways in which rights are promoted and protected in the work of this institution. So, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, I look forward to listening to members' contribution in this reflective and positive and non-confrontational debate about SNAP. I note the distance travelled so far and the successes there have been, but I note also that there is some distance to go. I congratulate the leadership panel on a successful first year, and I trust that it will ensure that good progress is made in meeting the objectives of SNAP by 2018. I repeat, I also commend the leadership panel on an excellent first annual report. I've said it's clear, accessible and user-friendly. As a committee, we acknowledge the hard work that has been put in to make it so. I therefore have pleasure, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, in moving motion S4M 11695 in my name. Many thanks.
I now call on Alex Neil, Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I say that Christine Graham is becoming very expert in consensual speeches in the Chamber, and I'm sure everybody welcomed that indeed. Can I say I warmly welcome the opportunity to debate human rights in my new role as Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights. Members will be aware that as part of that, I've taken, por taken on portfolio responsibility for ensuring that the Scottish Government plays its part in the creation of a modern, inclusive Scotland that protects, respects and realises the human rights of all our citizens. This ambition is central to the Scottish Government's efforts to tackle inequality and achieve social justice, and I'll come to that later. Next week, the 10th of December, marks one year since the launch of Scotland's first National Action Plan for Human Rights, or SNAP for short. Around this time last year, Nicola Sturgeon described SNAP as, quote, an important milestone in our journey to create a Scotland which acts as a beacon of progress internationally, end quote. A year later, I would echo these sentiments. SNAP has provided a framework and coherence to our collective ambition to build a better country. It has created a collaborative partnership between government, public bodies, business, the third sector and rights holders that seeks to drive forward the promotion and protection of human rights right across Scotland for the benefit of all. SNAP demonstrates that human rights are more than just mere legal instruments. They are the fundamental freedoms and rights to which everyone is entitled, and they're built on universal values such as dignity, equality, freedom, autonomy, and respect, all profoundly Scottish values. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the work of the Scottish Human Rights Commission over this period. They have played a key role in driving forward progress and I look forward to meeting, meeting Professor Alan Miller in my new role to discuss how we can build on the strong working relationship between government and National Human Rights Institute. I commend the first annual report of progress made to date. The report recognises that Scotland is alive with discussion and dialogue about the future of our country. These discussions have gone beyond the traditional parameters of party politics, and brought to the fore the importance of social justice, equality and fairness within our society, deepening and strengthening the participation of people in how our country is run will be a priority for me as part of our democratic renewal agenda. And I note the strong synergies of that ambition with the international human rights framework as an internationally agreed roadmap of values and principles. In terms of rights, we've made substantial progress since 2007. Devolution has enabled us to adopt Scottish solutions to Scottish problems, to protect our health service, to mitigate the UK government's welfare reforms, and to design a justice system fit for the 21st century. Shortly this Parliament this afternoon will debate violence against women which are fun is a fundamental breach of human rights and which we're all working hard to eradicate from our society. However, there still remain gaps to be filled. Too many people in our country live in poverty. There are persistent failures by public bodies to respond to individuals with a sufficiently human rights-based approach. Stigma and discrimination continues to be an everyday experience for too many of our minorities. Fundamental inequalities within a society require to be urgently tackled. That is why this government has argued for the maximum possible devolution of powers so we can begin to tackle the real challenges in Scotland. There is also much more to do to ensure that the people of Scotland both understand these rights and feel empowered to claim them. And that is why I'm pleased to announce today that the government will work with the Commission and others to support the development of an awareness raising campaign designed to help achieve a greater understanding amongst the population at large of why rights matter and empower them in how to claim their rights and make sure that we achieve 
our objectives. So in its first year, let us recognise the progress SNAP is beginning to make in contributing to tackling many of these issues. Through bringing organisations together to identify best practice, exchange experience and identify solutions for tackling the big human rights challenges in our society. Through the creation of opportunity for people whose rights are affected to shape the way things are done. Through the interrogation and challenge of existing ways of doing things and seeking to embed a common understanding of human rights in all that we collectively do and learning and participating in the international global drive to extend human rights to the whole of humanity because far too many in people in today's world do not enjoy the basic human rights, let alone these additional ones that we now take for granted in our own country. So we have a major part to play, both in Scotland and internationally, in making human rights a reality for all our citizens. Many thanks. I now call on Elaine Murray. Maximum five minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Last month, this Parliament voted by a large majority to reaffirm its support for the Human Rights Act of 1998 and its incorporation uh, of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights into this devolution statute. Today, we celebrate the first annual report of the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights. We look forward to the work it intends to progress and we highlight the benefits of a human rights approach to policy development and the provision of services. The requirement to abide by ECHR while legislating and the UK ratification of seven of the ten core international human rights instruments does not mean that human rights are embedded into our culture. Far from it. As the Cabinet Secretary said, we face many gaps in human rights in Scotland. Systematic poverty and social exclusion, economic and health inequalities, discrimination on the basis of gender, ethnicity, disability, mental health, socio-economic background. The rights of clients and patients in hospitals, care homes and in the care system uh, in general are too often not adequately protected. Later today we will debate violence against women. Domestic and sexual abuse are examples not only of abuses of human rights, but a failure to embed human rights in our culture. So there is much to do and much progress to be made. And however we legislate, however we attempt to lead by examples, governments and parliaments cannot do this alone. For example, equal representation of men and women in Parliament and Cabinet is a worthy aim. A female First Minister is an excellent role model. But unless all this is accompanied by a change of culture, it will not result in the equal opportunity for girls and women. It will not prevent almost one in five women in Scotland suffering sexual assault and a similar number suffering domestic abuse. It will not reverse the underemployment of qualified women in STEM employment. We only need to look across to America for an example of how leading by example, though important, is not enough. A black president in his second term of office, but of African Americans still suffering this disproportionate disadvantage. And we have seen very recently the lack of value placed on their lives by the country's law enforcement and legal system. SNAP is unusual and welcome, and it is not government-led. It involves 40 other, over 40 organisations, and its delivery will be overseen by a leadership panel, panel as we've heard, of 27 representatives from a wide range of public and sector and third sector organisations. One of the five groups set up within SNAP aims, unsurprisingly, to embed a human rights uh, in, into our culture. People understanding their human rights, involving the provision of better information and the introduction of human rights education in schools. And I was interested to hear the, the Cabinet Secretary's in, uh, announcement this afternoon. The media far often to, uh, uh, denigrates human rights to some sort of offenders or terrorist charter. But human rights are fundamentally about equality, defending the rights of us all and addressing the inequalities and injustices too many of our citizens suffer. Human rights can illuminate our approach to a whole range of equalities issues, gender, sexuality, disability, racism, poverty and sectarianism, to, uh, to mention a few. A human rights approach to health and social care should inform how young people leaving care are supported, should shape the support that carers themselves require and should recognise the right of all to independent living and to dignity. The Action Group on Better Lives is considering developing a network of local champions working to create a bottom-up approach to a person-centred policy development. 
The report notes that there is currently limited understanding on how a human rights perspective can be used to view the problems of poverty and inadequate living standards in Scotland. These issues are the focus of an innovation forum next week, which will include, importantly, people with personal experience of poverty, as well as representatives from civic society, the public sector and government. The connection between justice and human rights may be more widely recognised, but nevertheless, many people in Scotland still, still experience limited access to justice. And SNAP therefore uh, aims to improve access to justice for children, for people on low incomes, disabled people, and the survivors of sexual uh, and uh, domestic violence and abuse, including, of course, uh, the survivors of, of historic sexual abuse. And there, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to reconsider uh, the request for an inquiry into historic sexual abuse. Police Scotland has a commitment to embed human rights in its structures and in cultures, but issues such as stop and search and the now reversed, thankfully, routine deployment of armed police suggest that there is still some way to go in embedding the culture uh, in, into our law enforcement. And SNAP importantly also recognises our international obligations. It requires a greater understanding of and engagement with the obligations imposed on us by the United Nations treaties, which the United Kingdom has ratified. Presiding officer, Labour welcomes this first annual report. We look forward to progress uh, and to actions which truly embed human rights into all that we do, into all the legislation we, that we pass uh, and in all the policy uh, which we develop. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell. Maximum five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's National Action Plan is a very well-crafted and structured report, and one which belongs to dozens of organisations. And I pay tribute to the numerous individuals and organisations who have contributed to it in its first year. However, the plan is particularly impressive, not just for its successes over the past 12 months, but for its inclusive and collaborative approach. There is therefore a tangible sense of ownership as various stakeholders take responsibility for devising and delivering activities in their area of expertise under the guidance of the leadership panel. This is no top-down devised report, which after completion is merely going to gather dust on a shelf. It is a live, vibrant plan which from inception to completion and on to implementation has at its very core the cooperation, inclusion and collaboration of over 40 organisations throughout Scotland. In addition to this, in drawing together uh, of the Scottish Government's departments, third sector organisations and companies, um, this is really no mean feat, as is the bringing together of stakeholders to participate in the process of constructive accountability and independent monitoring. Crucially, the plan focuses on outcomes rather than processes or recommendations for recommendations sake. Significantly, of the 14 or so EU action plans, all except Scotland are government-led. As such, Scotland's national plan has deservedly attracted international recognition, even in its infancy, and it will no doubt continue to do so as it gathers steam in its second year. Presiding officer, this is a Justice Committee-led debate and the plan has an important part to play in helping the committee to carry out its monitoring and scrutiny of vitally important issues. Although not an exhaustive list, these include access to justice, a fundamental human right that needs to be recognised in the budget and sufficiently resourced to respect the rights of communities and individuals. Corroboration, a central tenant of Scots law designed to safeguard against miscarriages of justice now under threat. Stop and search, a tool which must be used sensibly and proportionately. And the arming of police, a policy which in its implementation must be open, transparent, accountable and again proportionate, which at the same while at the same time ensuring the public's protection. The Justice and Safety Actions Group focus on training and accountability in policing is therefore extremely welcome, while its other priorities will help to inform the Justice Committee's work going forward. The plan does, however, go beyond the structures and culture of policing by identifying ways 
to improve access to justice for children, survivors of violence and abuse. Sadly, this is very much a live issue, given the allegations of historic abuse which have been made in Scotland, including those of former pupils at the Roman Catholic Fort Augustus School in Loch Ness, as well as the Nazareth House in Aberdeen and Larchgrove Boys' Home in Glasgow. And Rotherham has dominated the public consciousness since it emerged earlier this year that 1,400 children were sexually exploited between 1997 and 2013. During his evidence to the Justice Committee in February this year, Professor Miller indicated that an apology law is very much a part of the draft action plan concerning victims of historic child abuse. I sincerely hope, therefore, that my proposed Apology Scotland Bill, which is currently with the Scottish Parliamentary drafters, will make some process, uh, progress in this regard in the context of civil litigation. Presiding Officer, to conclude, I look forward to year two of the Scottish National Action Plan and confirm having added my signature to the motion that the Scottish uh, Conservatives are pleased also to support the motion this evening. Many thanks. We'll now have a short open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please. Roderick Campbell to be followed by John Pentland. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. May I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates and also a member of Amnesty International. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this short debate. Human rights remain an integral part of this Parliament, and long may that remain so. Whatever the intentions of the Conservative Party, I believe there's a very limited appetite in Scotland to replace the European Convention with any type of British Bill of Rights. Indeed, the findings of the UK Bill of Rights Commission in their final report, dated December 2012, made that clear. But human rights don't exist in a vacuum. They are there to protect individual citizens. And while in convention terms, political and civic rights, rather than economic and social rights, are foremost, there is no doubt that as a living instrument, the jurisprudence of the European Court in interpreting the convention has responded to the changing needs of society over the last 60 years. Indeed, we should not just think of rights in terms of fair trials, freedom of expression, and the right to resist arbitrary arrest, important as they are but we should recognise the wider role. For example, in relation to Article 3, the provision prohibiting torture, inhumane and degrading treatment, we should accept its relevance to conditions in care homes, as indeed the Scottish Human Rights Commission do. Scotland has a proud record in protecting and promoting human rights. Uh, both the UK Equality Human Rights Commission in respect to reserve matters and the Scottish Human Rights Commission have a role to play. As Christine Graham has indicated, the Scottish National Action Plan for Human Rights is a recognition that this Parliament takes human rights seriously. A year ago, we debated the launch of SNAP, the first such action plan in the UK. A roadmap, cliched or not, as the convener suggests, for the realisation of all internationally recognised human rights, which is perhaps better described as the Scottish approach. SNAP has three identified outcomes, better culture, better lives and better world. In relation to better culture, as Amnesty International say in their helpful briefing, quote, the design and delivery of SNAP has been engaging, participative and innovative. A wide range of organisations and individuals have been involved from the very beginning of the process. The very act of bringing together a diverse group in this way is already starting to have an impact on how Civic Scotland views human rights. Indeed, the fact, as Amnesty International go on to state, is that so many organisations and individuals have devoted time and resources to SNAP demonstrates a great deal of commitment among Civic Scotland to human rights, something I hope that this Parliament reflects. In relation to better lives, this is clearly a very wide area, but in the area of health and social care, embarking as it is at present through an important journey of integration, there can surely be no better time to demonstrate the importance of a human rights framework. And I welcome the creation of the SNAP Health and Social Care Action Group, one of five such action groups set up to date. There does, it would seem, appear to be a far greater acceptance of the need for a person-centred approach to care. As a corollary to that, it would seem to me that attempts to build a career structure in the care sector would substantially improve the likelihood of successful outcomes for patients concerned, for patients concerned and reinforce respect for them. But there are, of course, real issues for disabled people and others which are not being recognised. As Inclusion Scotland point out in their briefing, the current programme of welfare reform is having a devastating and disproportionate impact on disabled people. 
They suggest that the prime motivation behind the replacement of DLA has not been about empowering disabled people to the same freedom, choice, dignity and control as other citizens, but rather it has been about cutting the welfare budget. The Justice and Safety Group will be developing a human rights-based strategy on violence against women and will no doubt be looking carefully at human trafficking. In relation to Better World, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has, of course, a crucial role. They have warned of the dangers of the Conservative proposals to repeal the Human Rights Act, jeopardising the rights of the people of Scotland and stress the importance of opposition from the Scottish Government and Parliament on this issue. Clearly, in any event, as SHRC have pointed out, this is an important year for the UK and indeed Scotland in international human rights terms, as the UK will examine civil and political rights in the UK. Presiding officer, close. SNAP has made a good start. Let's wish it well for the coming year. Many thanks. I now call John Pentland to be followed by Alison McInnes. Presiding officer, it doesn't seem like very long since I last stood in this chamber to talk about human rights, but then it's an important issue and deserves its second outing in a month, especially when we now have a new Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, who may be less keen of excluding Scotland and withholding funding from the UK, UK Supreme Court. I'm still not sure why the previous Cabinet Secretary thought it was a good idea to bar Scottish people from using this channel to protect their human rights, for who knows where that would have led. Of course, the previous Cabinet Secretary wasn't the only one who has proposed tinkering with their human rights. The Tories have launched an offensive rooted in their distrust of all things European, such as the Court of Human Rights, which it accuses of mission creep. They also blame Labour for extending human rights, and I'm happy to help shoulder such blame, but having referred to Labour's proud record in the previous debate, I think that we can just take that as read, and I'll spare you the details this time. Suffice to say that I fully support our continued membership of ECHR, E C H R, and while the Scotland Act prevents the repeal of the Human Rights Act in Scotland, I oppose any attempt to undermine it in the UK, and indeed any attempt to undermine human rights anywhere. The focus of this debate is the Scottish National Plan for Human Rights, also known by its snapper title, SNAP. SNAP will be one year old on 10th of December, which of course is Human Rights Day. Indeed, it is something of a season for human rights, with the 16 days of action against violence against women, which is the subject of the next debate. And just two days ago, it was International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. Now, with human trafficking propagating modern slavery in Scotland, we need legislation to tackle this. And I look forward to the government's bill promised as a response to Jenny Mara's bill. Presiding officer, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and SNAP's leadership panel are to be congratulated on the development and progress that they have made with this plan, as the other organisations who have been involved with its forums and action groups. And there is no shortage of challenges in the field of human rights and equalities. For example, the Scottish Human Rights Commission highlighted in its briefing that there is a recognised need for existing resources to be directed towards delivering the commitments it made in SNAP. The challenges are far-reaching, and this is reflected by the five action groups that are tackling the SNAP, the SNAP commitments to building a better human rights culture, improving social, economic, health and justice outcomes, and fulfilling our international obligations. And I hope that the ideas that they have con contributed and the issues that they have highlighted will be taken on board by the Scottish Government and that they will lead to further action, whether it be guidance, policy or legislation, as appropriate. President officer, there still remains the question of SNAP's future status, and I would welcome the Scottish Government's clarification about how it plans to consolidate the work of SNAP and ensure its continuity. Many thanks. And I now call Alison McInnes. Thank you very much, President Officer. Well, SNAP has made an impact and, and good progress, I think, in the first year. And it's good to have an opportunity to debate it today ahead of International Human Rights Day on the 10th of December. 
Members have already spoken about the practical value of SNAP in raising awareness, understanding and respect for human rights throughout government, public service and communities. And the report notes that there's still a lack of understanding among decision makers and, and indeed frontline workers about the value of human rights. So I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement earlier of an awareness raising campaign on why rights matter and, and how to claim those rights. Be this is vital because the Scottish Human Rights Commission stresses that good intentions do not always translate into good practice. And there is no better example than Stop and Search. As the Year One report suggests, it's proven an early test for SNAP. Last week, I chaired a meeting of the cross-party group on children and young people focusing on the impact of this tactic. Representatives of the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Commissioner for Children and Young People told Police Scotland in no uncertain terms that the use of voluntary stop and search was indefensible from a human rights perspective. Every encounter, every purpose, purposeless unwarranted search of the public is a distinct intrusion incompatible with Article 8 of the Convention. So on any level, let alone in the current industrial scale, it's intolerable. And I'm still astonished that this government permits the police to conduct hundreds of thousands of these violations each year. It's even more baffling because they don't need to have much time. The police possess a range of legitimate statutory search powers, rightly based on intelligence and suspicion of wrongdoing. And even the SPA concluded there is no robust evidence that voluntary stop and search prevents crime. So I will be pressing the new Justice Secretary to reflect on this and back my efforts to ensure that all searches are regulated, accountable and rooted in law. So given that all three organisations play a leading role in the developing and enacting of SNAP, the difference in views between SHRC, Children's Commissioner and the Police was telling. And it reminds us just how much more work needs to be done, conversations to be had, procedures changed before we can hope to realise our ambition of a mature democracy that truly respects and protects the rights of all. And that is why effectively measuring progress, identifying tangible targets, is key to understanding year-on-year -year advances. So I welcome that the Monitoring Progress Group has been established to do just that. And I was interested to read that the focus in 2015 will be to involve those whose rights are directly affected by SNAP. That's admirable. But those whose rights are most frequently infringed are often disenfranchised, vulnerable or unrepresented. We're talking about vulnerable elderly subjected to medical restraint through prescribed drugs, children exposed to so-called justifiable assault despite UN calls to remove the reasonable chastisement defence, the 202 young people who last year received treatment for mental health problems in non-specialist wards, those waiting over six months to access essential CAMS treatment has occurred in half of the, the NHS boards. And people like Fiona, subject to a guardianship order, she recently told me that she's incredibly frustrated that she isn't supported in taking those decisions she's capable of. Instead, all rights to control her life have been removed. It wouldn't always be easy to identify such people, let alone make contact and have the opportunity to listen to them. But doing so is critical to understanding and enhancing the impact of SNAP. It will help build public support for human rights through demonstrating that these aren't remote or obstructive legal concepts. And it will help to ensure that SNAP makes a difference to the lives of people across Scotland. Many thanks. We now turn to closing speeches. I call on Margaret Mitchell. Maximum four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close this short debate on the Scotty, uh, for the Scottish Conservatives. In the Chamber this time last year, members expressed their cross-party support for Scotland's National Action Plan uh, on human rights. And one year on, it's clear that the consensus remains. Not only that, I'm pleased to see that the plan has made its mark and significant progress since its inauguration at the International Human Rights Day last year. Britain has a proud tradition of human rights and they remain a central part of what this country does to promote good practice around the world. In his remarks to the Justice Committee in February this year, Professor Al Milne highlighted that Scotland's national, national Action Plan, although in its infancy, has already attracted considerable international interest, as well as support from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. 
This is indeed a testament to the work of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the Plan's Leadership Panel and all its stakeholders. However, it would be doing a great disservice to this debate if we were not to highlight the difficulties human rights legislation can find itself in so far as the public perception on human rights is concerned. Two YouGov polls carried out within the last four years found that over 70% of the public believed that human rights legislation was being manipulated to favour criminals and that its scope was being too widely applied in a manner never intended. Here, the inclusive approach taken by Scotland's National Action Plan and the addressing of wide-ranging issues from health to justice, all of which matter to people in Scotland, will, I believe, go some considerable way to redressing this balance. Furthermore, Presiding Officer, there is a need to ensure that when an issue is being scrutinised, all the relevant information is made available. For example, when acute concerns were raised over the use of stop and search, this led to an inquiry being undertaken by the Scottish Police Authority, which published its findings in May this year. Amnesty International, the Equality of Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights um, Convention uh, were initially on the list of witnesses However, they were ultimately not invited, invited by the SPA to give evidence. At the same time, advocates of the policy, including Police Scotland, the Police um, Federation and the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, all provided substantial input. Clearly, what happened here was certainly not in the spirit of the collaborative approach of the Scottish National Action Plan. Finally, and on a more positive note, Police Scotland has committed to contribute towards the implementation of the plan, which should help further to embed human rights within the structures and culture of policing. So as we move to year two of the plan, I'm sure the committee will look forward to monitoring not only Police Scotland's progress in implementing the plan, but all the other justice-related bodies' implementation as well. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Pearson. Maximum four minutes, please. Uh, Presiding officer, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary to his new duties and responsibilities and look forward to seeing an energetic response to the issues around human rights. Uh, it's often fashionable to record that Scotland it reflects human rights as one of its traditional values, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary said that in good faith. In truth, uh, although at the highest level we would reflect that in all we seek to do, in reality, we wouldn't need a SNAP plan, we wouldn't need committees to oversee these matters as if we had reached that development in our society where human rights were taken as a matter of course and no longer thought about. The fact that so many examples have been given during the debate today, hopefully in a non-contentious fashion, indicates there is much work to be done here and that work needs to be led by this parliament and by the groups involved. A second, can I thank the Justice Committee and the authors of the plan and the 40 organisations involved in developing the plan, the work that they do in our name and on our behalf. The work is absolutely vital if each of us are to be allowed to play our full part in what our modern Scotland is to be in the future. Human rights are easily identified when each of us considers the rights and the entitlements that we see for ourselves as inalienable. The cultural and other challenges come to be faced and are clear when we visualise what limits we would seek to put on other people's rights. The disabled, children, prisoners in our custody, migrants, asylum seekers, victims of crime, those who suffered historical abuse as children and still await a public inquiry. And I would remind the Cabinet Secretary or tell him if he's unaware, we were promised by the Cabinet Secretary for Education a commitment from the Government before December break 
on whether or not there is to be an inquiry into those matters, and survivors wait with bated breath on that outcome. Each of these categories, the idea of human rights, can cause the heckles to rise in some part of our community. And that challenge is what we need to face and use evidence to ensure that they realise, in reality, it is poverty, it is the weaknesses that we apply in our approach to gender and ethnic background, which play a major role in determining the opportunities that people can access in delivering on their own future. Mr. Uh, Neil indicated that, that there are gaps to be filled, and I encourage him in filling those gaps, and will give him every support in the efforts he make in so doing. If I can recommend to him that he reanalyse our national approach to freedom of information and the way in which information is granted to citizens and to those who represent citizens, the difficulties that each and every one of us face when we make these applications, the way in which data protection legislation is in actual fact felt across the country in its administration. It's not a delivery of response in terms of the words of the legislation that we should seek in Scotland. It's a delivery of response in the spirit of the legislation, an openness to evidence, an openness to facts, so that we can trust citizens, we can trust the authorities in making rational decisions on the basis of all the information that's available to them. When we arrive at that state of being, then we know that each and every one of us can access all that Scottish society can bring to us and we can be a stable and forward-looking society. Thank you. I, we support the motion. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Neil. Maximum six minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Since it's been mentioned a couple of times, let me just confirm that Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, will return to the Chamber before the Christmas recess to update the Chamber in relation to historic survivors of child abuse. Uh, and uh, I'm sure through the Bureau a specific time will be set aside for that, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also say I think this has been quite a good show, albeit a very short debate, uh, and although it's been broadly consensual, there have been one or two barbs, but uh, that's always the case and that's the sign of a healthy debate. But I actually slightly disagree with what Graham Pearson said in the opening part of his final remarks when he said, hopefully there'll come a day when we don't need commissions, we don't need watchdogs and all the rest of it. I think with human rights, it's one of those areas where no matter who's in power, no matter how much is written into legislation about human rights, I think we all need to be continually uh, on our watch, uh, both individually and collectively, to make sure that there is no erosion and continuing enhancement of human rights. Graham Pearson. The Cabinet Secretary, the point I, I poorly made was that I'd like to see a state of grace where human beings, as a matter of nature, acknowledge each other's human rights without the need for governments of any colour to intervene. I think, we, I think we would all agree with that. I am very much reminded by uh, Albert Camus, who was a tremendous uh, philosopher and who had the theory about rebellion. And his view was no matter which shape the government, even if it appears to be your government, the best way, the best source of progress and progress in making sure the rights of the citizen are protected is always to have one or two rebels uh, to challenge government and to challenge parliaments. Yes. And uh, I, I, I actually think that Christine Graham may be related <laughs> to Albert Camus in terms of uh, that. And can I say this extends into wide ranges of areas of policy. I mean, as a member uh, and as an MSP for a constituency which has got many pockets of deprivation, I, for example, see many aspects of the operation of housing policy, which quite frankly does not meet the human rights of tenants or the human rights of potential tenants uh, in some of our housing situations. And it's another example of the many areas where we have all got to be uh, very much on our guard and take whatever action is necessary at whatever level is necessary to make sure that the human rights of our citizens are being promoted and protected. 
I do think uh, there is a distinction, however, between what's happening in Scotland and their overall attitude on a consensual basis and the approach of at least some UK politicians. David Cameron's speech to the Conservative Party conference earlier this year committed his party to scrapping the Human Rights Act and replacing it with the so-called British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. And I would place in record, presiding officer again, the Scottish Government's strong opposition to the idea of a British Bill of Rights to replace the Human Rights Act, because we believe that that would be a cover to scale back protections that currently exist. Indeed, last month, this Parliament united around the principle of that consent being refused. But also part of the Council of Europe, which of course predates the European Union by a considerable period, at least 10 years, 47 countries across Europe have committed themselves to democracy, human rights and the rule of law through the Council of Europe. And as the Cabinet, as the Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for human rights, I will stand shoulder to shoulder with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and others to ensure that the Human Rights Act does remain on the statute book in our country and that we continue to be part of the convention system that upholds our fundamental rights on a daily basis. And when I'm next in London uh, next month, I intend to seek meetings with human rights organisations so that I can make that position clear, as well as establish closer cooperation on cross-border issues in relation to human rights with some notable organisations at the forefront of the human rights agenda. We're not unique in the values we hold. We're no more precious than anyone else and in the commitments we display. Uh, but as I've implied, these are features uh, of many of our closest European neighbours who I think would take a very similar, if not identical, approach to human rights and the retention of the role of human rights acts throughout Europe in protecting the rights of our citizens. Uh, we, I think, do have something probably called the Scottish approach. It's not necessarily better than everybody else's, but it does fit in with uh, our own approach in terms of how we serve our own communities. And I think that is on focusing and achieving outcomes and delivering real improvements. And I think our approach is grounded in an assets-based response to the challenges facing both individuals and communities and seeks solutions through co-production. Those are all part of a human rights view of the world, one that puts real people at the centre of everything we do and which wants to empower and include and enable. That perspective is one of the fundamental strengths of SNAP. It is a co-produced response to the challenge of delivering in human rights for everyone in Scotland, not a top-down approach uh, to uh, human rights from government or parliament. Ultimately, presiding officer, it is for nations themselves, through their institutions and their public services, to ensure that human rights are protected, respected and realised for our citizens. SNAP will play a central part in turning the values and principles of the legislation into a practical reality for the people of Scotland. We're we are committed to playing our part in that journey and I look forward to returning to this chamber annually to discuss the progress we're making in pursuit of SNAP's ultimate vision of a Scotland where everybody lives with fundamental human dignity. And when we next return, I hope we will have made even more progress on a whole range of the issues that have been discussed here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on John Finney to respond to the debate. Maximum eight minutes, please, eight. on behalf of the committee. Hey, thank you, President Officer. And can I refer to my member, uh, register of interest as a member of Amnesty, please? And I welcome this opportunity as the Justice Committee's rapporteur to the SNAP process to close this debate on behalf of the committee. Like our convener and other members, I'm pleased the committee are engaged in the SNAP process and I'm delighted we've uh, secured this inaugural debate, coming as it does a few days before International Human Rights Day. I, too, am glad that the SNAP process is up and running. I congratulate Professor Muller and the SNAP leadership panel on a first year that's been very productive and I commend the panel on a first class annual report and, and echo many of the members comments about its user friendly nature and perhaps there's a note there for other public bodies to act on. Um, it was particularly encouraging to hear from Professor Miller last week that the human rights approach taken in Scotland is perceived internationally as being one of the most collaborative in Europe. 
Um, and I know, having spoken to Professor Miller earlier today at another meeting, that he's just returned from Ukraine. And I think it's great that Scotland's position with regard to human rights is viewed on the international stage very positively. Um, and indeed, securing this debate has been an extremely positive uh, uh, development, and, and I've enjoyed listening to the speeches that we've heard. And I'll turn to some of those now. We heard from the convener about the compre uh, comprehensive resume of uh, SNAP um, and outlining the role that the Justice Committee plays in relation to that. And of particular uh, significance, I think, was the phrase, all the time because we do consider human rights um, as regards all aspects of our undertaking. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's new role in his por portfolio, um, and I commend the words he used, protects, respects and realises. I think that's uh, uh, terribly important, and they, he certainly outlined values that I think everyone in the Chamber would sign up to, not least democratic renewal he referred to, and the gaps that are to be filled. Can I particularly welcome the announcement, as others have, I think that raising awareness is terribly, terribly important. Um, Elaine Murray uh, talked about the Human Rights Act and the, the recent vote that we have um, and commented that the human rights are not embedded and listed some of the challenges that that gives rise to uh, and the need for cultural change, particularly with a gender perspective around a number of uh, women's issues. That, uh, I thought that was uh, important. Um, Margaret Mitchell referred to the plan as being inclusive and collaborative in approach, and I think that's entirely right, and going on to say that the effect that that had on the ownership of it, um, describing it as a live, vibrant plan, um, laid out some of the just, uh, criminal justice challenges that, that come with human rights, um, uh, and uh, I would commend the apologies legislation that uh, uh, Margaret Mitchell alluded to, and indeed welcome Conservative Party support for the motion. Rod Campbell talked about uh, the need to protect the individual citizen uh, and the wider role that human rights play in that, particularly making reference to care homes. And I think the suggestion of a career structure for workers in that important industry is terribly important. He also talked about something that's equally important, that is the commitment of civil Scotland to human rights and the approach that we've seen. John Penland, um, uh, if I noted him correctly, said commendably he would oppose any attempt to under -right, under, uh, undermine human rights anywhere. And I think that's, uh, uh, I would hope we would all subscribe to that. He talked about the, the significance, the connection with violence against women and slavery. And like him, I hope there's support for Jenny Mara's hard work that's been done in that particular field. Alison McInnes talked about um, why rights matter and, and the awareness there, and talking about the issue that, uh, that certainly exercised um, a number of committees, and that is the issue of stop and search and the voluntary versus statutory nature of that, and that perhaps in that particular example highlighted the, the, the competing elements of that, uh, um, the, the, the rights-based approach. Um, talked about measuring process and I think, importantly, the rights of the disenfranchised, citing patients and mental health, and that's a recurring theme, the challenge for people. Um, uh, yes, sir. David Stewart. I'm aware that the Public Petitions Committee, which I have the honour of convening, has recently had a petition which argues that the lack of legal aid for defamation cases breaches human rights. Would you agree? John Finney. I think that access to justice is a fundamental human right and there are challenges around the uh, fin financing of that um, and there are competing demands. But yes, certainly access to justice is a, a right denied. Uh, is, if not achieved, is a right denied. Graeme Pearson talked about the freedom of information and he's summing up and the, the fact that the citizen needs to trust the authorities. And I think that's very, very important too. Um, it's a bold and holistic vision uh, coming, covering a number of policy areas that, that have been looked at. And health and social care has been mentioned um, uh, where the rights there are, are used to justify uh, the, the safety of individuals. Um, and I think that the work being done to ensure justice for victims of historic child abuse is particularly welcome, as is the development of a comprehensive human rights-based strategy on violence against women. And I think we'll hear more of that later this afternoon. The action that SNAP has taken to embed human rights in structures and cultures of policing is perhaps unsurprisingly obviously of considerable interest to the Justice Committee and the Subcommittee on Policing. And we will watch developments there with interest, particularly as they consider issues of stop and search and armed police uh, that Alison McInnes and others have alluded to. And we certainly welcome the SNAP focus on these key areas. Um, the Justice Committee's involvement in SNAP is a committee we've sought to consider human rights in our everyday work. As I've said, we've asked difficult questions of decision makers 
on issues like police complaints, investigations, prison monitoring and visiting, uh, visiting arrangements, women offenders, modern slavery and, of course, stop and search. As we are considering the forthcoming Prison Control of Release uh, Scotland Bill, human rights considerations will be at the forefront of our minds. Uh, uh, and they will be, as they will be when we consider the human trafficking legislation and the legislation on fatal uh, uh, accident inquiries. As a uh, rapporteur, I'll continue to meet with uh, Professor Alan Miller to discuss progress with SNAP, and as a committee, we will continue to engage constructively on these issues. As our convener said, we shall be a critical friend of the process, supporting the leadership panel in delivering SNAP, but holding them and their partners to account to ensure that its objectives are indeed delivered. Uh, coming to a, an end, convener, um, President Officer, uh, it was the second Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, who said that, and I quote, freedom from fear could be said to sum up the whole philosophy of human rights. As a parliament, we want to help build a Scotland of confident and fearless citizens who are able to reach their potential free from fear, free from barriers, and free from discrimination. With the European Convention of Human Rights incorporated into Scots law under the Scotland Act 1988, this Parliament has human rights embedded in its DNA. I very much enjoyed today's debate and I welcome the SNAP annual report. I welcome the fact that there's already been tangible results. I welcome the fact that SNAP is gaining international renown and I welcome SNAP's ambition for a sustainable human rights culture in all areas of our lives. I hope that we as a parliament we as a Justice Committee and we as individual members and citizens can help turn that ambition into reality by 2018. And I conclude by indicating my support for the convener Christine Graham's motion. Thank you. Many thanks. That concludes the Justice Committee's debate on Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11789 in the name of Michael Matheson on violence against women. Could members who wish to speak in this debate please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, maximum 10 minutes, please. Signing officer, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I'm pleased to open this debate on such an important issue as working in partnership to end violence against women. It is intolerable that violence against women is still a feature of Scottish life and that thousands of women, children and young people are affected by it. It has no place in the Scotland that we all want to see. This debate is timely, coming as it does during the annual 16 Days of Action, a global campaign to raise awareness of the need to eliminate violence against women. The Global 16 Days of Action is welcome as it also assists in providing a focus on this important issue. What is already happening in Scotland, of course, is 365 days of action as day in, day out, the police, prosecutors, our courts, advocacy groups and other key stakeholders tackle the blight on our society that is violence against women. Signing officer, I welcome the opportunity of this debate to do two things. To set out to members our proposals for tackling violence against women in the coming year and an opportunity to highlight the excellent work being done to help overcome violence against women within our communities. I also want to pay tribute to our many police officers who are doing their utmost to keep our communities safe and to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to account. And I also want to take this opportunity to pay particular uh, tribute to our specialist advocacy and support services, such as Women's Aid, uh, Rape Crisis Scotland and ASSIST. These organisations are giving support, advice and comfort to women, children and young people at a time of great need. And I also want to say that these organisations uh, and also a great many others such as Zero Tolerance, the uh, Women's Support Project, White Ribbon and Engender to name but a few, these organisations over many years have helped to raise awareness of and influence and shape our understanding of men's violence against women. 
I'd like to take a moment to reflect on what has been accomplished this year. Having effective laws in place and enforced is a crucial part of our strategy in this area of policy. That is why we have strengthened the law to make forcing a person into marriage a criminal offence, adding to the existing civil protection of forced marriage protection orders. We have launched Equally Safe Scotland's strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. We have begun an extensive programme of work to tackle female genital mutilation, including strengthening the existing law to ensure that individuals who are not permanent UK residents can still be tried in the Scottish courts, establishing a short life working group to make recommendations to strengthen our approach on female genital mutilation, and providing £20,000 to the Scottish Refugee Council to undertake a range of research activity, including on best practice in other parts of the UK and Europe. We have also worked with Police Scotland on the development of their disclosure scheme for domestic abuse in Scotland, alongside partners including the Crown Office, Scottish Women's Aid and Assist. This scheme, which is commonly known as Clare's Law, enables people in relationships and their close family and friends to ask for information about their partner's background if they suspect their partner has a history of violence. The two pilot schemes in Aberdeen and Ayrshire began last week, and I am very hopeful that following the successful evaluation, we will see this scheme rolled out right across Scotland. We welcome the excellent work that Police Scotland has undertaken on domestic abuse and rape and sexual assaults, and the focus and energy that they have given to tackling these crimes. Police Scotland has improved the investigation of rape and other sexual crimes, setting up a new National Rape Task Force and Rape and Sexual Crimes External Advisory Group, which now operates across Police Scotland to inform and to improve rape investigation. Last week, I visited one of Police Scotland's specialist rape investigation units based in Livingston, where I met with Detective Superintendent Pat Campbell to hear more about the vital work that this unit undertakes. President Officer, in setting out our programme for government last week, we announced that we would consult on the introduction of a new specific criminal offence of domestic abuse. We int intend to do this in early 2015, and I want to explain why. We have listened to those who deal with domestic abuse day in, day out, such as prosecutors, advocacy groups such as Scottish Women's Aid and Assist, who have said that our current law does not properly reflect the experience of those who experience domestic abuse. We have a range of current law uh, that can be used to prosecute domestic abuse, including common law of assault and the statutory offence of threatening and abusive behaviour. But these laws tend to focus on the prosecution of individual instances of criminal behaviour, such as an assault or a threat, for example. However, we know that the full seriousness and impact of a particular incident can only be truly understood when we recognise and understand how it sits within a broader pattern of control, coercion and abusive behaviour, whereby an abuser attempts to exert control over every aspect of their partner's life. In some cases, an abuser may never resort to physical violence. So strong is their control over their partner uh, and their fear uh, that their partner has uh, of that control. The dynamics of domestic abuse are very complex. And we appreciate that there is no simple solution or easy fix. But we think the time has come to seek views on whether a new specific offence of domestic abuse, one which reflects how it is actually experienced by victims, will enable our justice system to better respond to domestic abuse and ensure that victims are able to tell their whole story of what has happened to them when their case 
comes to court. Last week's programme for government also announced that we will bring work uh, to create, bring forward work to create a specific offence to deal with revenge porn. This is the malicious distribution by a person of intimate images of their partner or former partner. It is often, but not always, motivated by an act of revenge for the end of a relationship. Organisations like Scottish Women's Aid, as well as members of this parliament, including Christina McKelvey and Alison McInnes, have highlighted this as a growing problem, especially as we become increasingly tech savvy and social media becomes an intrinsic part of our life and relationships. In July 2013, Scottish Women's Aid launched the website Stop Revenge Porn to raise awareness of the issue and provide a forum for women who have been victimised in, the, way, in a way, the same way to allow them to share their story. The Scottish Government's position on this issue is clear. It is completely unacceptable for anyone to breach the trust of another person in this way by posting intimate personal photo photos online. There are already offences that can be used to prosecute this conduct and many of the perpetrators have been brought to justice. But there is some evidence to suggest that victims often don't come forward because they don't know that is what that a crime has been committed against them. A new offence will help to raise awareness and I believe also send a very strong and clear message to everyone who might be tempted to share these kinds of images without consent. Proceed and you will face the full force of the law. It will also enable us to better monitor the scale of this particular problem. President, President Officer, the desire, drive and determination to rid our society of the scourge of violence against women has united this parliament since its very early days. One of the first members' debates... I'm afraid the, member, the, minister has, the cabinet secretary has to close. One of the first member debates in this parliament, when it was re-established in 1999, was a member's debate brought forward by the Labour MSP Maureen McMillan, which was on the issue of domestic abuse. I don't believe that that passion and commitment to tackling this issue from all parties in the chamber has in any way diminished over those 15 years. Cabinet if, ever, must ask you close. if ever an issue that transcended party politics, this is it. And together, I believe, sign officer, we can make a difference. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I have to tell the chamber that there is no extra time in this debate, I'm afraid. I call on Graham Pearson to speak to move amendment 11789.1, maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary to his new duties and indicate the support for the Government motion and would seek to engender support from across the Chamber for the amendment in my name. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging all that the Cabinet Secretary said at the end of his uh, speech and uh, reflect the, the value of the words that were contained there. Uh, I'll take the opportunity today to dedicate what I say this afternoon to a woman I first met 43 years ago. The week before Christmas, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't help her. Uh, she was, uh, unfortunately, my first homicide inquiry, which turned out to be the culmination of two years of domestic abuse. Uh, the reason for the violence on that day is that in the absence of our partner, who was the father of one of our children, she had the temerity to purchase some Christmas presents for the children, but on return from the pub, uh, the partner was so enraged by this action that not only did he decide he was going to beat this woman, but he took his shoes off, put on a pair of boots in order that he could uh, deliver the blows more effectively, and proceeded for the afternoon to kick her, stamp her, slap her, punch her to death. The reality of that I rehearse today because in the 43 years since, there have been thousands of women in Scotland who have faced the same kind of behaviour and have died. Behind that are hundreds of thousands of women and girls 
who suffer psychological abuse, what we would call minor physical abuse, all with the view to demeaning and to controlling their futures by primarily men, unfortunately. In the last year that we have records, over 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse recorded in Scotland. And it's a matter of record that women suffer that abuse often more than five times before they make an official report. And once that report is made, the women and the children that they seek to protect are left in limbo as they try and deal the, with the outcomes that arise from the abuse that they suffer. It's interesting that in the past, the authorities have often encouraged uh, those who are being abused to move away and uh, leave the home that they share with their abuser. In the last year's figures, the numbers of incidents where ex-partners and ex-spouses have abused uh, a victim have risen from 32% to 44%. So the notion that we merely separate people in order to bring a conclusion to the abuse is limited in its impact. And as a result, the services need to consider how they offer best support. There is matters to be considered by our Cabinet Secretary in relation to the way in which the justice system responds to reports. The domestic abuse cases going through our courts in Glasgow and Edinburgh are delayed. A family who are left in a situation having made a complaint about an abuser can ill afford delay in the way justice is delivered and some form of respite offered to them. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to look at the reasons for those delays and where he can to intercede in ensuring that delays are kept to an absolute minimum. The significant funding that's required, particularly for third sector organisations, is best utilised. And victim support, women's aid, uh, rape crisis and many other agencies operate very effectively in these circumstances, but together they can only do so much. And uh, I seek in the amendment to open up our minds further to considering the efforts that government can make and should make in its contribution to change the nature of relationships between men and women in this country. To create within the education environment a new ethos which seeks to deliver respect between boys and girls, men and women. I'm happy to take it. I'm, I'm very grateful Mark to McDonald's. the member for giving way. I wonder if he would acknowledge also the role that the media has to play in this, in particular some media outlets which encourage the objectification and sexual objectification in particular of women. Graham uh, uh, you beat me by a heartbeat in, in making that comment because my next bullet point is to indicate that the media and internet have an impact in this environment and I have no doubt the Cabinet Secretary, through United Kingdom authorities, Europe and United Nations, we need to address how we might best turn the corner to ensure that the culture, which I would call a page three culture, is rejected as a way of life in Scotland. And that the contents of a report which uh, seeks to deliver a uh, strategy in terms of gender equality which deals with some of these issues, should be considered by the Cabinet Secretary and where appropriate implement. I would indicate that class has no bearing on those who suffer this kind of behaviour. And that often those who are more affluent and, and middle class protect themselves from the embarrassment that comes with reporting domestic abuse. And we need to bear that in mind. The provision of support for victims needs attention. There's no doubt that budgets are stretched, but the Cabinet Secretary would do well to identify those elements that work effectively and deliver on behalf of victims and their families and invest what funds we do have uh, in what works and ensuring long-term uh, delivery. Too often, these organisations spend please. years looking at how to get funding rather than delivering their services. The court provision I've mentioned and the Procurator Fiscal Service that lies behind it in servicing the, the courts is an important element that we need to deliver going forward. 
Finally, I welcome the consultation for domestic abuse legislation and also revenge porn, and I look forward to contributing to the outcomes that we achieve in relation to that. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I will now call on Annette Milne. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all formally congratulate the Cabinet Secretary on his new role, as this is the first time I have faced him in the Chamber since his promotion. In his previous role as Minister for Public Health, he responded to many a member's debate on health-related issues which I participated in, and I will miss his contributions there. I am pleased to be taking part in this debate and to support the motion, which I am sure will have cross-party consensus, because we all want to see an end to violence against women and to support those women, children and young people whose lives are blighted by it. I am also happy to support the amendment in the name of Graham Pearson, because there is no doubt that women are often portrayed as sexual objects by some media and other channels, and this is not acceptable in the 21st century. In passing, I would also like to acknowledge the plight of the increasing number of men who are the victims of domestic abuse, often forgotten because they are very much in the minority, although their suffering, particularly psychological, is no less than that of female victims. Domestic abuse is largely hidden and unreported, but it does take place right across society and takes many forms, both psychological and physical, and causes untold misery not only to the immediate victim, but also to children who may witness assaults on their mother on a regular basis. And the mental scars that these children bear last a lifetime. It's encouraging that a, an increasing number of women are finding the courage to report domestic abuse, but disturbing that 30% of people prosecuted for this crime as recently as two years ago were let off without any punishment. This surely cannot be toler tolerated, and perpetrators of violent and sexual crimes against women must be penalised for their actions. So we welcome the forthcoming consultation on um, specific legislation for domestic abuse. There are, of course, many forms of violence against women, apart from domestic abuse, including rape and sexual assault, stalking and harassment, and commercial sexual exploitation, which includes human trafficking. Jenny Mara did a great deal of work to expose this abuse of women, and I'm pleased the Scottish Government has given support to her, her efforts by promising to introduce a human trafficking and exploitation bill next year. Some other forms of violence against women are largely restricted to some ethnic communities within our society. Honour crimes, for example, are known to account for the deaths of 12 women a year in the UK, although this is likely to be an underestimate. And over 1,300 cases of forced marriage were dealt with last year by the UK Government's Forced Marriage Unit, of which around 3% originated here in Scotland. But I want to focus on female genital mutilation, which is a brutal act of violence against young women and children. It's often performed without anaesthetic, with dirty makeshift and shared implements, and it can lead to immediate and long-term physical health problems and to psychological consequences which can ruin the lives of many victims. It has been rife for many years in parts of Africa and the Middle East and Asia, but is increasingly found in the Western world among Im immigrant and refugee populations. It is deeply embedded in the culture of practising communities, not because of religion, because it is not a requirement of any religion, but rather as a rite of passage to womanhood and a requirement of acceptability as a wife. And sadly, the custom is often per perpetrated by the older women in a community who have undergone FGM themselves and see it as necessary, as a necessary, indeed a loving ritual, which will secure the best future for their daughters and granddaughters. The practice is kept very private within communities, and because relatives are often involved, statistics are hard to come by. But a study in England and Wales as far back as 2007 estimated that nearly 66,000 women aged between 16 and 49 living in the UK had on, undergone FGM, and over 24,000 girls were at risk. I was a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee just before the passage of the FGM Scotland Act in 2005, and I well remember the harrowing evidence that was presented to us very secretively at the time. I am appalled that there have been no prosecutions in the nine years since the passage of the Act, and that the Equal Opportunities Committee is again having to take evidence from the communities where the practice is, li is rife. Obviously, it takes time and education to overcome such a deep-seated custom, but this really needs to be backed up by enforcing the legislation which is in place. Presiding officer, a debate like this can only scratch the surface of an issue as diverse as violence against women, and I have dealt with only a very small part of it. However, I welcome all the steps which are being taken by the Scottish Government and the various organisations mentioned in the motion to try and stamp out violence against women and to support those affected by it. Much clearly remains to be done, 
but I particularly welcome Police Scotland's disclosure scheme for domestic abuse, or Clare's Law as it's known, currently being piloted in my home city of Aberdeen and in Ayrshire, which provides a formal mechanism for women worried about a partner's past record of abuse to make inquiries about him. And I welcome the work being undertaken by the FGM Short Life Working Group as a step forward in eradicating that atrocity. Presiding officer, I look forward to hearing all the contributions to this debate, which no doubt will be as diverse as the range of violent behaviours which blight the lives of many women, children and young people in Scotland. And of course, I support all efforts to eradicate them. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Very tight for time today. Four minutes. Speeches call on Sandra White to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Can I also welcome... Uh, Michael Matheson to his uh, new post as Cab Sec of, of Justice as well. Uh, you're welcome, Michael. Uh, I would like to be begin my contribution by thanking the many organisations, uh, some in the gallery here today, locally, nationally and internationally, uh, for the work they carry out on behalf of women suffering abuse and violence and support that they give to them. And I was particularly struck by um, Nanette Milne's contribution in regards to the international aspect of FGM and trafficking. I think it's something that's very, very important. And being a member now of the Equal Opportunities Committee, I look forward to looking to inquiries in regard to FGM. Can I also thank uh, uh, the Minister of the Cabinet Secretary sorry, for his uh, very, very uh, worthwhile commitment to what's been put forward in the Scottish Government's Plan of Action and Government Programme, which obviously he explained a lot better than I could, and, but with more time as well. Uh, basically, uh, we know that the programme has four key commitments uh, for tackling abuse and revenge porn, uh, basically the specific offence of committing domestic abuse, legislation to address revenge porn, uh, as Nanette Mill had already mentioned, bringing together leading academics to look at the causes of domestic abuse. I think that's something very, very important to look at the causes, to look at how we can share the evidence and what we can do to prevent uh, domestic abuse and reduce the harm also. I think that's probably one, for me, one of the key aspects of that as well. And obviously Claire's Law, which has already been mentioned too. I want to also touch on uh, Graham Pearson's uh, amendment, which uh, I also uh, fully support. I, I, I think uh, Graham has touched on a number of issues, if not just the page three commitment, but also obviously you know, trafficking, human trafficking. But uh, the, the way they provide, uh, well, project women as sex objects, and you know, it's not just um, women of a certain age. You've seen it the way society treats young girls, expecting certain things from young girls. And I think that's a real worry. It's a cultural aspect. And I think if we're going to tackle it, we have to tackle it as, as far as that. And if I could just draw the attention to page 23 of the Equality uh, Report, I think this practically sums it up. And it's not in my words. It's in the words of the people who wrote the report on behalf of the Scottish Government and COSLA also. And it mentions that the media too has a powerful influence in either reinforcing or challenging the attitudes and norms that contribute to violence against women. Numerous studies link sexualised violence in the media to increases in violence towards women. Rape myth acceptance, that's an important one, rape myth acceptance and anti-women attitudes. This is particularly worrying when the images used are of very young women. Now, I hope the media is listening, all aspects of the media. It's something that we have to get across. Women are not sex objects to be looked at. They're equal with men and should be treated exactly equally the same. And I do support Graham Pearson's amendment. I think it's something we really have to look at. I know we're tight for time, so I'll finish this now, President Officer. Thank you. Excellent. And if others follow Sandra White's example, then we'll get everyone in. Now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by James Dornan. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would also like to welcome Michael Matheson to his post and indeed welcome the publication of Equally Safe, the Refreshed Violence Against Women's Strategy. And there are no great changes of direction with the strategy and other than it includes violence against girls. The test, as always, will be what we do in practice, whether more people are accountable for their actions, whether we change attitudes towards perpetrators and whether we change attitudes to the victim of that violence as well. I want to raise two issues in particular in the short time I have. Firstly, sexual exploitation of women and girls, and this is a growing problem. 
Many of those in prostitution as adults have already been abused or exploited as girls. Therefore, the change in definition in equally safe is very welcome. Those who exploit girls can be held to account, but as we've seen in Rotherham, it's not always easy, as exploitation and grooming is not widely understood. And I remember uh, listening to a comment made by someone involved in that case that really struck home. And it, they were saying, how do we stop a child escaping to the hands of an abuser? And it shows how effective grooming can be. It also says something about our care system, well, where children find more affection in the, at the hands of an abuser rather than at the hands of a, the state. But I think that is a debate for another, um, another time, but it's something we really have to tackle. I welcome that Equally Safe continues to recognise prostitution as violence against women and girls. However, we need to do more than recognise that fact. We need to do something about it. And the Scottish Government can deal with this by criminalising the purchase of sex acts, by decriminalising those that are exploited and making support available to them being exploited, providing them with roots out and the support they need to get their lives back together again. And it would show real courage and commitment to make this step change. It's happened in Northern Ireland, and I applaud their vision, but I would have to say I'm disappointed that in Scotland, which used to lead the way in the whole of the United Kingdom, um, with steps taken to tackle violence against women, is now lagging behind. In the time left, presiding officer, I want to turn to domestic abuse and the issue of parental contact. Where a parent has been violent to their partner, it causes untold damage to the child, and reports state that that damage is the same as the child itself being abused. Our justice system then continues to force further abuse by granting contact, and this has to change. The accepted position has to be that an abusive parent never gets contact unless they can, approve, they can prove that they have changed their behaviour. Contact enables a parent to continue to perpetrate the abuse using the child as a weapon. And I've got numerous constituency cases where this has happened. Contact visits being used to control the mother by changing the times, bringing the child back early or late, or indeed grooming them against their mother. I've also had cases where the child is being abused, abused itself, but the mother is forced to continue to force their child to make that contact or be in contempt of court. I've had cases where there are restraining orders in place, but contact has been used to force the child to divulge where they're now living so the abuse can continue. And that not only means numerous moves for the family, but it also leaves the child feeling responsible for this and again being damaged. I've also had head teacher write to me telling me that if the mother loved their child, they would attend parents' nights along with their abusive ex-partner in spite of being in fear of their life. We also Doctor, need close, domestic please. abuse training for professionals in every field that deals with children and families. And it shouldn't be just the police, but also for those in the justice system and health and education professionals. We are rightly proud of what we've achieved from Maureen McMillan's first speech, but we've got an awful long way to go to free women and girls from must violence. Close, please. Many thanks. Now call on James Dornan to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Sign officer, violence against women under any circumstances is wrong, and it's clear that we all agree with that. Clearly, it physically hurts those attacked, but often the psychological scars it leaves can be even worse. And in many cases, the worst kind of violence is domestic violence. Just think how awful it must be worrying about what will set him off tonight. And despite some of the emails we've been receiving, it's almost always a him. Wondering if he's drunk, had a bad day, or just feels in the mood for taking out on you. What way is that for anybody to live? And that's why I want to talk today about the DAISY project, formerly known as DAP, Domestic Abuse Project, in my constituency. It's one of the many great groups across the country doing invaluable work to support women and their families who have been affected by domestic violence. They recognise that domestic violence doesn't just happen in a vacuum, and it can have both long-term and wide-ranging impacts. They know there is no one-size-fits-all solution, and that each family has different needs. Based in Castlemilk, in, in my constituency, they're easily accessible to those that require their assistance. Over the past three years, they've helped 300 people in the south side of Glasgow address issues of domestic abuse. And their services include one-to-one -one support, small cell group work, personal development, training, access to services and agency assistance. They've also set up the self-help group Women Against Violent Environments, WAVES, led by the extraordinary Bessie Anderson. 
Waves empowers women to address local issues, including the domestic abuse, and to overcome the drawbacks of poverty, including the lesser talked about aspects of isolation and self-esteem, and to help them regain control of their lives. They are supported in their aims by local housing associations and nurseries who act sensitively when issues of gender-based violence are raised and try to do what they can to ensure that the women and children are housed and educated appropriately. I feel privileged when I get the opportunity to meet and support organisations such as this, but the truth is, I wish I didn't have to. I have seen how difficult life can be for some of these families and wish they never had to go through this. I have heard of, kids, of how kids become withdrawn and how long it can take to get them to come out of their shell. And I've seen so often the behaviour of the male perpetrator can leave a family near fin financial destitution with all the problems that that can bring. Presiding officer, every year I run a Christmas toy appeal in my constituency and people are invariably responsive, generous and kind. These toys are then passed on to local churches and groups in the constituency, including Waves. And it broke my heart when I was told for the first time that for some of these kids, it will be the only substantial present that they get over the festive period. And that's not because their mum doesn't love them, but it's because of the mayhem created by violence against a woman. It's a sobering fact, which is why I'm behind my, my, have my wholehearted support for the government's violence against women strategy, Equally Safe, which was published in June. When it was published, Lily Greenan, manager of Scottish Women's Aid, said that the publication was a significant step towards addressing and preventing that violence. This publication was also welcomed by the police, Solicitor General and other local and national bodies, including ASSIST. We know that violence against women is at heart an issue of power. It is accepted that one of the primary causes of domestic abuse and biggest barriers to tackling it is persistent and consistent gender inequality between men and women, which we all have a responsibility to address. And I was pleased with the message that the, the First Minister had, uh, sent out when the, we ended up with Scotland's first 50-50 cabinet. Presiding officer Ban Ki-moon said that there is one universal truth applicable to all countries, cultures and communities. Violence against women is never acceptable, never excusable and never tolerable. It is clear that across this chamber we agree with his universal truth and there is considerable political and civic will in Scotland for domestic violence to become an issue of the past. However, until it is, and I hope that day comes soon, I thank goodness with such important organisations as the DAISY Project and WAVES to assist the victims of this insidious crime. Many thanks. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christina uh, McKelvey. Officer, I welcome the, uh, the motion today and also the equally safe uh, document that was produced this week. As the uh, document itself said, it's not a delivery plan but a strategic uh, framework. So we need to see uh, a robust action plan with clear and measurable outcomes and uh, timescales, as was promised at the launch. And it seems the timetable for that has slipped a bit, so it would be good to get an update from the Minister on when that will be uh, developed. I was very pleased to see the document uh, restate the position of this Parliament since its start that gender-based violence is a function of gender inequality and an abuse of male power and privilege. I was also pleased to see the emphasis it put on primary uh, prevention, obviously addressing those systematic inequalities, but also the attitudes and assumptions that give rise to uh, violence and abusive behaviour. And in that connection, I also welcome, of course, uh, the Labour Amendment, which emphasises the cultural context for this and the way in which the objectification of women and misogyny are fostered by the media and uh, the internet. And in fact, the whole question uh, of pornography on the internet is a massive issue, which is very difficult to deal with, but we certainly must do something about because it is poisoning uh, the attitudes of so many young men towards, and indeed men in general, towards uh, women and sexual uh, relations. So prevention is crucial, and uh, obviously uh, the work of zero tolerance should be very closely uh, uh, um, studied in that regard because they've done uh, superb work uh, for over 20 years in that area. But over and above prevention, of course, we also need the provision of services. And uh, Priority 3 talks about women and girls accessing relevant, effective and integrated services. And the motion is quite right to praise Scottish Women's Aid Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, women supporting women, uh, and indeed many others could be mentioned. For example, in my constituency is the Edinburgh Women's Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre, whose work is unfortunately uh, more uh, necessary and indispensable than ever. Last year, referrals to that centre were up 20 per cent, and indeed the long-term support and counselling services that it runs currently has a 12-month wait, and that's why I hope that its application to the Violence Against Women
Women uh, and Girls Fund uh, uh, that it's putting in will be successful. All rape crisis centres, of course, have had a, a rape uh, crisis-specific grant for 10 years, uh, set at £50,000 in 2004 and still £50,000, so we welcome the continuation of that fund, but clearly it would be desirable if it could be increased to some extent. And the third area after um, um, prevention pre and provision is, of course, uh, protection. And priority four in the document says that we want women and girls affected by violence and abuse to be supported by a sensitive, efficient and effective justice system. And in many ways, there's been great progress. For example, uh, the police uh, attitude to this has improved immeasurably, and we should praise the work of Police Scotland in this area, the Rape Task Force, the Des Domestic Abuse Task Force, and in terms of the justice system, the work in particular of the Solicitor General and the Crown Office Reference Group. But sometimes women are not getting the protection they need. And in fact, in just the last week, I've had two uh, women in my constituency who've approached me because they are not getting the protection they need. And obviously, I'm taking up their particular cases. But of course, recently, all over the newspapers was the problem of the um, outstanding uh, writer Janice Galloway in relation to the stalking laws. And I'm glad that the Scottish Government is looking at um, the operation of non harassment orders because there do seem to be some loopholes in that regard. So laws may need to be amended as well as new laws made and we certainly welcome all of us the new laws on a domestic abuse and revenge form. Finally, two points. The court service also must prioritise this area. Great to have uh, the domestic abuse courts which again started 10 years ago but we have to do something about the weights for Restaurant those uh, close, courts. Please. And finally, recording is an issue too. We have no figures on the number of rapes reported to the police that end up in a conviction and it would be very uh, useful and important to have such figures. Excellent. Many thanks. I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Leah MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I, like others, welcome this debate and the motion and the amendment in, in this, the 16 days period that we um, all look and reflect and remember. Um, President Officer, I'd love to see a day when we don't need to talk about violence against women, when it's just an historic idea. It would be fantastic to live in a world where Saturday nights after the football aren't littered with the battered bodies of wives and girlfriends, where brilliant organisations like Women's Aid are no longer needed. More than any other area of social and criminal justice, domestic violence legislation is the one that I would love to be able to say we no longer need. But back from utopia and into daily realities, the Scottish Government has set a clear framework which we welcome, detailing their approach to tackling violence against women. It has been welcomed by all the leading third sector organisations working in the field and it is worth noting particularly today that the White Ribbon campaign to involve men in tackling violence against women has welcomed uh, the, the Government's approach to at lunchtime today, along with Malcolm Chisholm, the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, and many MSPs, including all the party leaders, more than, were more than happy to sign the White Ribbon Statement of Intent. This cross-party campaign backing our violence against women strategy is an important element to the equally safe approach. Men are part of the problem, but they are sure, a sure part of the answer to men talking to other men will probably have a greater impact than women talking to men. The key to all of this, of course, is change and social attitude, and no legislation will ever create that on its own. The way to change social attitudes is to make the behaviour completely unacceptable, with decent education at the earliest stage possible. It might seem a trivial comparison, but look at the moment how unacceptable smoking has become. The legislation kick-started that, but it's been behaviour that's turned that law into very good practice. Another law which has been mentioned today that is seeking to change the cultural environment is Clare's Law. The legislation gives the right to anyone, and I stress anyone, not just those directly involved, to seek information from the police when they feel that they see a potential victim or a perpetrator. You do not need to be the heterosexual partner, as some people have asked me questions. You could be in a same-sex relationship, or it could be a friend, or it could be a relative, a neighbour, or even the child who is realising that they are concerned about someone. Anyone can apply, and I really welcome the pilots. I do not have a lot of time to go into the full process here, but the bottom line that is if, if you are concerned that someone could be a potential victim of domestic violence, then this is the mechanism that will allow you and that potential victim to find out more about a potential perpetrator's background. 
Most of you all know, as has been mentioned, there's a six-month pilot of Clare's Law in Ayrshire and Aberdeen. I'll be watching it closely, and I sincerely do hope that it would lead to full rollout of the scheme across Scotland. This will be another step on the way to outlawing an apparent but daily practice. And I don't have time to go into the issue of revenge porn, but I wish to make my colleagues aware of the current consultation that's running now by Women's Aid Scotland. Um, it's running until January, and I welcome any future legislation on that topic in particular. In the meantime, presiding officer, let Can every one of us follow White Ribbon's personal pledge, the pledge most of us signed today. And if you haven't signed it, you can contact Callum and he will make sure you get your copy of the pledge to sign. And that pledge says, I pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about men's violence against women. And I commend the motion and the amendment. Many thanks. I now call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Gil Patterson. Hey, thank you very much. Can I start too by congratulating Michael Matheson on his promotion? I think the reward for a constructive approach he's taken in his ministerial duties uh, thus far. Can I also uh, welcome this uh, timely debate, the pertinent amendment, and I think powerful contribution from uh, Graham uh, Pearson. Can I also welcome the gender equality in this debate, uh, frankly, uh, but also the publication of the strategy equally safe. Uh, can I add my thanks uh, to the police, to the various voluntary and third sector organisation uh, for the contribution they make. I think there is no doubt that without the work they do in day and daily to help in very practical ways, Scotland would be a much lonelier and uh, more dangerous place for women and girls facing violence. Uh, we must support our voluntary sector to continue to do uh, the excellent work uh, they do. And I would be uh, interested to understand uh, the, the implications, for example, of funding for um, violence against women work in, in Orkney uh, being around half of what was uh, requested. I don't really know what the implications of that are, but it strikes me uh, that it is worth exploring. The third sector also, I think, are due recognition for the enormous input they put into policy making in, in this area. Their direct experience of working with women and girls is invaluable, and their determination to see change is to be commended. It is clearly a determination we all share in this chamber, and that is reflected in the strategy uh, and in the measures from the programme for government to tackle domestic abuse and revenge pornography, which I very much welcome. Uh, but there are no quick fixes. Legislation can help. It can highlight uh, an issue, but moving it up the political agenda is not a remedy in itself, as Christina McKelvey rightly observed, because gender-based violence is sadly still too deep-rooted a problem which requires a major cultural shift. In the time, brief time that we're debating this today, uh, I understand at least nine women in Scotland will have suffered violence at the hands of their partner. In 2012-13, there were over 60,000 incidents of reported domestic abuse. The increase in reporting is welcome, but the scale of the problem is self-evident, and many, many incidents we know go unreported. So achieve, to achieve the vision, we need to bring communities with us. We need to instil mutual respect in each and every individual in Scotland. And this starts in our homes and in our schools. The packs of materials available from Zero Tolerance and others for primary and secondary schools I think are an excellent resource, uh, as these early years are entirely vital. As others uh, have observed, we, we need to look more widely at this issue. It is one that blights societies across the globe. And I think it is only fair to acknowledge some of the work the UK government, particularly my colleagues uh, Lynn Featherston and Joe Swinson, have been taking, not just in the UK, but further afield, including the investment of £25 million in a new Violence Against Women and Girls Research and Innovation Fund to support new programmes to tackle the problem worldwide, also campaigning for zero tolerance on female genital mutilation mentioned by Nanette Milne and others, a practice which serves no religious or uh, cultural or medical purpose and can be uh, extremely harmful and even fatal. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I, even as a novice to, these, to this, uh, this debate, uh, I am conscious that it is impossible uh, to do justice to the complexity of the issues that we are considering in such a brief debate. But I very much welcome the fact that it is taking place. I very much welcome the extremely strong and united message um, being sent out uh, by this Parliament. And I will conclude uh, by repeating the comments from Ban Ki-moon uh, quoted by uh, James Dornan earlier when he said, there is one universal truth applicable to all countries, cultures and communities. Violence against women is never acceptable, never excusable, never tolerable. So yes, our vision and the strategy is ambitious, but aspiring to anything less 
is unacceptable, and I support the motion and the amendment in Graham Pearson's name. Thank you. Thank you. Now, call on Gail Patterson, followed by Cara Hilton. Presiding officer, looking over some of the briefing papers that were sent to me regarding the debate, makes some depressing reading. 58,976 incidents of domestic abuse were reported during the year 2013 to 2014. That equates to officers from Police Scotland attending a domestic abuse incident every nine minutes. Whilst this figure shows a decrease in the number of incidents reported from the year before, it still is a shocking figure and shows that more is needed to be done if we are to eradicate this from our society. Figures obtained by Scottish Women's Age shows that the reporting of domestic rape increased by 81% over the same period. 3% of adults had experienced serious sexual assault since the age of 16, but this varied by gender with 4% of women experiencing serious sexual assault since the age of 16 compared to uh, with 1% of men. The overwhelming majority of serious sexual assaults have been carried out by men. Figures show this to be as high as 94%. Over 83% of victims actually knew the offender, with 54% saying that the abuse was carried out by a partner. Therefore, it has to be acknowledged that progress is grindingly slow. But that is not a criticism towards the Scottish Government or our Parliament. I have got the greatest respect for the present Government for the effort and the resources it has provided to tackle this massive problem. My respect extends to all previous administrations in this Parliament who took this matter deadly seriously as well. In fact, since the re-establishment of our Parliament to the present day, the attitude to the, to, to, and effort has been outstanding. So whilst we have uh, our differences across this chamber on various issues, it is pleasing that all parties are committed to working together to tackle this issue. Men's violence against women and children, and indeed, I, I do say children, is deep-rooted in our society. It comes from millennia of men's power over women and the lack of equality. The less equality there is, the more likely it is that the women will be abused. You only, look to, you only need to look at the plight of women worldwide to come to that conclusion. So I'm really pleased on two fronts that Scotland is and has been seriously tackling and challenging this issue, whilst at international level, Ban Ki-moon, as previously stated, made a very, very strong declaration. In my view, I, it would, and I would make a suggestion that equal rights for women and children should also fit into that great declaration. This in itself would make a massive impact on men's violence against women and children if it was enacted and became a reality in terms of rights for women worldwide. Closer to whom I am also of the opinion that by tackling gender inequality through er eradicating differentials in job opportun opportunities, wage gaps, positions of rank and so on and so forth, that violence against women and children would actually reduce. In other words, you draw to a close, equal please? status across genders will equate equal power and the end of men's power over women and children. I commend this motion and the amendment to the Parliament. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now I call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate brings home the fact that despite the progress in recent years, we've still got a lot to do to achieve our goal of eradicating violence against women and girls, to ensure that every woman and girl in Scotland can not only live free from fear, but can also live their lives to the full and achieve their dreams. I don't think we'll ever achieve true equality in society unless we end the abuse of power and control that is at the root of domestic abuse and violence, and which continues to affect too many women and children across Scotland. And as MSP for Dunfermline, I'm very conscious that I'm only here in Holyrood today because of the offences my predecessor committed against the women in his life and the fact that those women were finally brave enough to come forward and report the domestic abuse. 
A shock in one in four women will experience domestic abuse at some stage in their lives. And as Graeme Pearson has already commented on, two women every week are killed by an abusive partner or former partner. Domestic abuse happens in every community. There is no class, age, cultural barrier to abuse. In Fife last year, 4,646 incidents of domestic abuse were reported to the police. 84% of these were reported by women. Yet this is only the tip of the iceberg. Many women, women continue to stay silent, never finding the courage to speak out, never mind the strength of the confidence to make sense of the abusive, controlling or violent behaviour or to regain control of their lives. A few months ago, I attended the launch of Sage Scotland, which is based in Fife. And Sage has secured big lottery funding and rolling out their groundbreaking Freedom Programme, which provides emotional and peer support to women living with domestic abuse and violence, empowering women to regain control of their lives, equipping them with the self-confidence and self-esteem to ensure that power is back in their hands where it belongs. And this work is absolutely vital because many of the women that Sage are helping before they went, uh, got the help, they didn't recognise that their relationships were harmful or abusive. And it can be really difficult for them to make positive choices when you're mentally broken, when you've nowhere to turn. And as colleagues have alluded to, the way that the media continue to report stories involving male violence and women generally really doesn't help the situation at all. Having met with some of the women participants on the Freedom Programme, their, their stories really are truly inspiring. It is a programme that changes lives. Uh, Janet Henderson and Sally Sinclair, who run the project, are doing an absolutely brilliant job. Um, and I would encourage the Minister to visit Sage Scotland to find out more about the valuable work that they do and the way they, and they empower women to regain control of their lives. The Government's motion today congratulates White Ribbon Scotland on its eighth anniversary. And yesterday, Fife became the first area in Scotland to be awarded a partnership award in recognition of Fife's achievements in promoting this brilliant campaign. Encouraging men to take the pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women. With a quarter of all pledges across Scotland being made in Fife, a healthy male speakers network, a proactive social media campaign and Fife white ribbon lessons in our high schools, Fife is certainly leading the way. And this is also the case with projects like Cedar and Marek, which unfortunately I'm going to have to cut out my speech because I'm running out of time. So we are seeing positive developments um, in an issue that is continuing to make an impact on too many women and children in Fife and across Scotland. But more needs to be done if we are to achieve a more equal, fairer, more just society that we all aspire to. The Scottish Government's equally safe strategy is extremely welcome. But we now must see concrete action to put this, practice in, uh, put this into practice as quickly as possible. And I hope that across the Chamber we can work together to tackle domestic abuse, to support victims and to end the gender-based violence that continues to destroy lives, destroy self-esteem and destroy, destroy the freedom of too many women and children right across Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on Christine Graham, be followed by Margaret McDougall. As others have said, Deputy Presiding Officer, domestic violence knows no bounds from the demeaning to death and no boundaries on gender, age or class and almost entirely takes place behind closed doors, whether it's lace curtains, in housing schemes, leafy bungalow land or even mansions. The Police Scotland statistics show that for 2012-13, as others have said, there were 60,080 recorded incidents. And I think this increase of 20,000 from 2003 is in part due to more confidence in reporting these incidents and indeed greater police training. I commend Chief Constable for Stephen House in prioritising attack, attacking the issue of domestic violence. But I want to focus on age because the Police Scotland statistics 2012-13 showed that in the age group from 41 to 50, there were over eight thousand incidents recorded and 51 to 60 nearly two and a half thousand in fact as a matter of fact in the age range of 41 to 50 it peaked almost matching the peak of recorded of those in the age range 26 to 30 now I think all these statistics understate the actual position but I think it may understate it more in the older age groups and, and I'll tell you why I think that I think quite often it's not presumed to take place in established relationships. What looks like a long and happy marriage may not be that. Publicity campaigns are very welcome, but the image usually is of a younger woman with a younger man who threatens uh, cows or abuses her as he comes home. This reinforces that stereotype. The older woman may indeed have a different view of whether or not she has been subject to domestic abuse because of her generational perspectives. It may be a heightened sense of shame, particularly if everyone thinks she's in a happy and secure marriage. 
may be apprehension and reaction of other family members if she says anything about it, indeed even to the level of grandchildren. She may feel that if she does, she's being disloyal to the family view of a great father figure. She may even alienate them, she fears she alienates herself from the members of her family. She may even think this is the way it has to be because it's always been like this and because domestic abuse can quite often be incremental, starting with small things about the way you comb your hair, the way you dress, what you say, how you eat your food, where you'll go, when you will go, how you will spend the money, and grows and grows until the person's really not aware that in fact they have been diminished by this power treatment of a partner. Can I say, uh, Deputy President Officer, I can't be the only person in here who has been, say, in a supermarket and witnessed an older man shouting at his wife or companion with language vulgar, distasteful, demeaning, with no sense of shame that he's doing this in a public place. And what crosses my mind is, if he can do this in the middle of a supermarket with people listening, what on earth is he like at home? And the other thought that crosses my mind is, why is she taking this? Why is this is what she expects to happen to her in a public place? So can I say, Cabinet Secretary, in your new position, and I've welcomed you before, in these publicity campaigns, can I suggest just an occasion, you show an older woman who is being abused in a public place with language like that, so that they too will recognise that their human rights are being abused, we've just debated it, and they too are entitled to dignity, and what they are being subjected to is domestic abuse. Oh. I now call on Margaret MacDougall to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too welcome the Cabinet Secretary to his new post. I welcome this opportunity to speak in this debate today on violence against women, particularly since North Ayrshire, the area I represent, has one of the highest recorded incidents of domestic abuse in Scotland. Violence against women is wide-ranging and covers sexual offences, forced marriages, trafficking, prostitution and honour crimes, as well as domestic abuse, and I'm sure everyone in the Chamber is concerned that many of these crimes are increasing. Firstly, I would like to welcome that Ayrshire was selected as a pilot area for Clare's Law, and hopefully this will prove to be a positive new development in the protection of potential victims of violence from men. And returning to North Ayrshire, where between 2003 and 4 and 2011-12, domestic abuse incidents attended by the police increased by 90.5% from 996 to 1,897, a truly shocking figure. This resulted in the creation of the Multi-Agency Domestic Abuse Response Team, or MADART. That comprises of the Council, Police, NHS, Ayrshire and North Ayrshire's Women's Aid, and members of the North Ayrshire Violence Against Women Partnership, which has since reduced incidents in North Ayrshire by over 4%. That was in 2012-13. There have also been key improvements in other areas, such as 33% increase in the direct support to victims with children and reductions in the time taken to respond to incidents involving victims with children from an average of around 10 days to 3 days. MADAR shows that the benefit of organisations pooling and sharing resources to address the needs of victims resulting in improved communications and information sharing, but most of all, providing effective support and better targeting of resources and services to the victims. My understanding is that this is currently unique to Ayrshire and perhaps other local authorities should adopt this approach too. However, while I welcome the reduction in incidents since MADAT was established, it's clear that we need to keep the momentum going and build on that work which is the foundation for a long-term programme that needs to be supported. With all that in mind, I was appalled to learn that the SNP-held North Ayrshire Council is proposing to replace the holistic service North Ayrshire's Women's Aid provide and replace it with a watered-down version, minus services for children and minus women with addictions. 
and also cut the funding to that reduced service by 20%. In conclusion, presiding officer, I will be keeping a watchful eye on the outcome of Clare's law and anticipate that the assessment of the pilot will show that some women have been prevented from becoming involved with known violent men and that will then be rolled out across Scotland, as the Cabinet Secretary has said. I also commend the MADART initiative for its role in driving down domestic abuse in the Ayrshire area and hope it continues to be supported as schemes like this should be replicated across Scotland. But most of all, today, on behalf of the women in North Ayrshire, I ask if the Cabinet Secretary will intervene in the proposals by SNP held North Ayrshire Council to cut the holistic services and funding of North Ayrshire Women's Aid in an area which desperately needs to protect women from abuse in their homes. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call on Mark McDonald to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, as a man, uh, Presiding Officer, I am part of the problem. Uh, I haven't always spoken out. I haven't always intervened when people have been making comments or acting in a way that perhaps ought to be challenged. And I think there are many of us who would acknowledge that sometimes that is the case. Sometimes you take the option that the quiet life is the easy life and you allow those attitudes to permeate. I have done in the past. Uh, I remember many years ago ending up on the deck on Union Street in Aberdeen when I intervened in a situation and at the time I, I felt it was better I was the one who took the punch. But I resolved the day when I signed the statement of intent that I will do better and do more and I will not stand by and allow some of those attitudes to be uh, put out as uh, what is seen as banter uh, but all too often uh, continues to perpetuate a, a sinister uh, element in society. I welcome the remarks by the Cabinet Secretary because um, I, in the debate on the programme for government I raised the issue around the psychological element of domestic abuse. Violence, absolutely, physical violence, sexual violence must absolutely be stamped out and must be tackled. But the psychological element is often uh, in place for a, great, for, a, for a great length of time before it uh, manifests in physical or sexual violence. And if we are able to tackle that psychological element, uh, we can often prevent women from falling into the uh, situation where they are abused physically uh, or sexually. Um, and the control and coercion element, you know, often uh, you see comments uh, where a, a woman has gone back to the man who is abusing her and there is questions around why is it that she's doing that? Why does she go back? And it comes back to the psychological control and coercion. The fact that in many instances the woman has been made to feel that she is deserving uh, of the treatment that she is receiving. Christine Graham, I think, summarised that very eloquently, that she believes that it is her fault that she is on the receiving end of the abuse. And that comes down to the psychological element. So uh, the, the government have my full support uh, in trying to tackle that. I recognise that there will be difficulties around that, but I think it is absolutely important that that is tackled as well as the physical element. I also welcome the rollout of Clare's Law uh, in my home city of Aberdeen, and I hope for its success. And I'll certainly uh, be looking forward to seeing how that is uh, assessed at the end. Can I just end, presiding officer, on the issue around media perceptions? And I think that um, there's been some of this brought up, and, and I agree entirely with Graham Pearson when he talks about uh, page three culture. I think page three, frankly, it should have gone a long time ago. Now is the time for page three uh, and other outlets which propagate that kind of approach to, uh, to, to using women uh, in, in, their, um, in their publications. That should end. Um, but there is a wider issue around objectification as well. Uh, many of us will have been horrified by the decision of ITV2 in the first place to broadcast the uh, comedian, and I use the term uh, loosely, uh, dapper laughs, uh, a, a, a character, apparently, uh, of, of uh, Daniel O'Reilly, a comedian, who based his entire show around making light of sexual uh, assault, essentially, of women and sexual abuse of women, that this could even find its way onto the schedule uh, of one of our major broadcasters, I think, is utterly abhorrent. And one of the things I, I welcome the belated decision to cancel the show. 
I also welcome the decision by Theresa May, and it's not often I find myself welcoming decisions by Theresa May, but I do welcome her decision to refuse a visa to Julian Blanc, the supposed pickup artist uh, from the United States who wanted to come over here and again spread the notion that somehow Dr. sexual Dr. assault Close, and please. sexual abuse of women was just banter. But I think we also have to ensure that the strongest representations are made to broadcasters and to Ofcom, that this kind of thing has to be stamped out before it even gets onto our screens. Many thanks. And I call Alison Johnson, after which we'll move to closing speeches. <clears throat> Presiding officer, I'm pleased to take part in this important debate today, as to openly debate and discuss this subject is a way to help reduce society's tolerance of violence against women. And I thank all those organisations who've provided briefings for today. In the face of proliferating violence, it is difficult not to feel that progress has stalled or indeed reversed. Scottish Women's Aid highlight a case where a woman who's suffered domestic abuse says, your confidence goes, it's a gradual thing, and grinds you away until there's nothing left. But this organisation too has much experience and expertise and says, we believe that a world without domestic abuse is not just a dream, it's a possibility. Never doubt it, changing attitudes changes lives. Zero tolerance too tell us that change is possible and that we must make it happen. And we as a parliament can play a leading role in changing those attitudes, and we must. <coughs> Violence against women is a human rights violation of worldwide significance. White Ribbon tell us that at least one in five women in Scotland will experience domestic violence in their lifetime, and that a domestic violence incident is recorded every 10 minutes in this country. Violence against women and girls is endemic in conflict areas, where it's often a strategy of combat. But wherever it occurs, in other corners of the globe or in our own streets, it terrorises and humiliates. But violence against women doesn't take place in a vacuum. It takes place in a context where globally only 21% of parliamentarians are women. It takes place in a context of gender-biased austerity which disempowers women. In 2012, the Treasury admitted that of nearly £15 billion raised in cuts, 11 billion came from women. It takes place in a context where some national newspapers include a picture of a topless young woman alongside news, and where that picture will feature far more prominently than that of any prominent woman in the fields of business, sport, or medicine. And this media portrayal is very significant indeed, and I will be happy to support both the motion and Graham Pearson's amendment today. Because this media portrayal normalises the objectification of women. And it shouldn't be forgotten that gender equality is a fundamental human right. But yesterday, we learned that almost 60% of girls say they've been sexually harassed by boys. According to the Girl Guiding Scotland survey, girls as young as seven are being subjected to sexual taunts and grow up with sexual harassment as a normal part of their everyday lives. This is unacceptable and we must challenge it. Every day, our young people are bombarded with sexualised, sexist and often violent imagery. In Zero Tolerance's briefing on the sexualisation of young people in the media, we hear how, and I quote, violence against women and exploitation in the sex industry is frequently, frequently trivialised in video games. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas enables players to beat a prostituted woman with a baseball bat, complete with screams for help. The incredible realism now possible with such games means players can feel that they are really committing this act. Citizens often reduced to the role of consumer can make a difference. An Australian chain store has banned Grand Theft Auto V due to complaints about its depiction of violence against women. The Cabinet Secretary is right to say that there's no simple solution or easy fix. Our knowledge of what interventions are most effective for the prevention of gender-based violence is growing, though. Documentation, evaluation and legislation are key. We in Scotland will continue to call for and campaign for change. And there's clearly wholehearted cross-party consensus on this issue. In, in summing up, Presiding Officer, I too congratulate the yes, Cabinet Secretary closing. on his promotion, indeed, in closing. Um, 
and I would be very grateful if he could update the Chamber on the formation of a Violence Against Women Joint Strategic Board and on funding for multi-agency risk assessment conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now call on Mary Scanlon. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Scanlon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary. And may I also welcome the tone, which uh, I felt was very welcome in this uh, consensual debate. Uh, we are supporting the Government motion today and, indeed, the Labour Amendment. Uh, and we're pleased to note that the Government has included White Ribbon Scotland for their campaigning to ensure that men are part of the strategy. And I would also like to mention the good work of Amos here in Edinburgh, which I know is supported by uh, Jim Eady. Although the debate is entitled Violence Against Women, I believe that we need to include the focus on all children in the household and all forms of domestic violence, as several others have said, whether it be same-sex couples and uh, females against men. My first point uh, relates to uh, all children brought up in a household witnessing domestic violence. The Royal College of Psychiatrists state that boys can become aggressive and disobedient, start using violence to try and solve problems, and may copy the behaviour they see within the family. Older boys may play truant and start using alcohol or drugs, both of which are stated as a common way of trying to block out disturbing experiences. The Royal Co uh, College also states that girls are more likely to keep their distress inside, becoming withdrawn, anxious, depressed, thinking badly of themselves, more likely to harm themselves by taking overdoses uh, or cutting themselves, and most worryingly, they are also more likely to choose an abusive partner themselves. UNICEF's key findings on the impact of domestic abuse and violence confirms there is a strong likelihood that this will become a continuing cycle of violence for the next generation, stating that the single best predictor of children becoming perpetrators or victims of domestic abuse later in life is whether or not they grow up in a home where there is domestic violence. This is based on studies from throughout the world. So given that the impact on children is known and it's fully acknowledged, I would like to ask the new Cabinet Secretary what is being done to ensure that the children are also taken care of? What support is given to them, boys and girls? And I had a cross-party group on mental health at lunchtime. I apologise for not signing uh, Malcolm Chisholm's uh, motion. But that issue was ra raised there in terms of child and adult mental health. So equally safe is for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. But I would hope that it would also be for all children, given what I've said, including boys. My second point uh, talks about the strategy, and I read it cover to cover, uh, consistently talks about the need for full engagement of local authorities, uh, etc. Of course, my time's nearly up. Um, and it's really just to say that there needs to be strong leadership on community planning partnerships. Uh, my third point is a point that Malcolm Chisholm raised, and that's on uh, delivering outcomes targets. They're just not there. After 15 years, we still do not have... We're still told we will be developing a measurement framework that's not good enough. We need to do more. And finally, when you read about the perpetrators of domestic violence can expect the full force of the law, and yet in response to questions from my colleague John Lamont, the Scottish Government state that out of 10,500 prosecutions, 8,500 convicted. Of those convicted, 12% given custodial sentence, 25 community close, sentence, 30% were admonished. admonished. It's not really the full force of the law, but I do welcome what the new Cabinet Secretary has said and look forward to the new proposals. Many thanks. I now call Dr Elaine Murray. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start with concurring uh, with the Cabinet Secretary in his thanks to the many specialist advocacy and support agencies. Those are the national ones which are mentioned in the, mo the motion, but we also heard good examples of local initiatives such as DAISY, which D James Dornock told us about, and MADA, which uh, Margaret Mac uh, McDougall told us about. 
As has been said, this debate sits well with this afternoon's previous debate on human rights, as violence against women is clearly a human rights issue. The Scottish Human Rights Commission includes all gender-based violence in its definition. So that must be rape, it's forced marriage, it is, as Rhoda Grant said, prostitution and the purchase of sex, it's trafficking, it's female gen genital mut mutilation, it's sexual harassment, it's, it's domestic violence. Preventing violence against women is not only a domestic priority for Scotland, it is a legal duty set out uh, by several international obligations. Over the years, Scottish governments have taken action on violence against women, on female genital mutilation, on forced marriage this year, uh, and next, hopefully, on human trafficking, for which my colleague Jenny Mara is due uh, recognition for her role. And I, too, look forward to the consultation on uh, the, making uh, domestic abuse a criminal offence, and indeed, on its focus on the patterns of abusive behaviour, and also the work which will be done on reverse pornography. A number of uh, contributors, Liam MacArthur, uh, Jill, uh, Gil Patterson, uh, Christine Braham, made reference to the statistics on sexual offences uh, and on domestic abuse uh, and the increase in reporting uh, of both uh, domestic abuse and sexual offences, which we hope, of course, is due to people feeling more able to report and obviously due also to the work being done by uh, Police Scotland. But it's important, as both Cara Hilton and Christine Graham made, uh, told us, that we actually need to recognise that these figures are going to be too low uh, and there are still many reasons why people do not dare to speak, speak out or why whether they, they under-report because somehow they feel responsible for the abuse which is happening to them. Alison Johnson made reference to the Girl Guiding Survey, and I think actually that this week has been the statistics which have shocked me most. One in five, one in five girls aged 7 to 12 having experienced sexual comments from boys. I mean, what a shocking statistic. 59% of young women aged 13 to 21 have experienced some form of sexual harassment. Uh, and the media does play a, a part in this, as Mark MacDonald and Cara Hilton both pointed out. Um, you know, the, the statistics that these girls said about the media were also very re revealing. 58% of young women feel that the media blames rape victims' behaviour on their appearance, uh, or behaviour or their appearance for their attack. And actually, more than half of those young women dislike the disrespectful attitude shown towards music, women in music uh, uh, videos. And that silly exhibitionist Madonna, who apparently is taking her breasts out for a ph photographers, uh, you know, she does a total disservice to women by continuing to collude with that objectification of women and that sort of behaviour needs to be co condemned because that is doing no, women no good whatsoever. It really does illustrate how much that survey, how much work needs to be done because despite all the advances made over the last almost a century on women's rights and representation, I think women are as disrespected as they ever have been, possibly more so actually. And Malcolm Chisholm made a good point actually about the problem of access to pornography through the internet now, which actually normalises the view of sexual violence to young men in particular. Uh, and Sandra White, I think, also uh, referred to that role of the media, which is really uh, serious and ser seriously damaging in, in terms of the way in which women are, are presented in the media. I don't think anybody touched the, uh, on the issue of women offenders, because we know also that violence against women impacts on the justice, justice system, uh, because in Scotland, over half women, of women offenders in prison have experienced domestic abuse. One third have experienced sexual abuse, and past abuse was recognised by the Commission on Women Offenders as a significant part of the profile of women offenders. So evidence of the link between women's experience as a victim and subsequent offending actually led the Commission to recommend that services for women offenders should take their previous histories of abuse into account and should provide uh, counselling to deal with the trauma. Uh, women of all economic uh, groups su uh, suffer domestic abuse, as many have said, and women of all economic groups su suffer sexual abuse, but the link or between poverty and the inability to escape abuse or to seek redress has actually to be recognised. Uh, a number of people, Christina McKelvey, McKelvey uh, Cara Hilton uh, and others have mentioned the, the importance of Mark McDonald, the importance of the White Ribbon campaign. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear last week as I drove home uh, about the uh, uh, an initiative in Dumfries and Galloway uh, between the Domestic Abuse and Violence Against Women Partnership, the Dumf Dumfries and Galloway Council, Queen of the South Football Club and White Ribbon Scotland, uh, which, as we've heard, encourages men and women to pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about all forms of violence against women. And that campaign will be taken to football camp fans at the Queen of the South versus Rangers match on the 12th of December. That will be a White Ribbon match and it is part of the 16 days of global action against uh, violence against 
Against Women, uh, uh, the Domestic Abuse and Violence Against Women Partnership also instigated a songwriting competition for young people, which I believe is re reaching its final stages, uh, with members of the public being invited to vote online for one of five songs considered to be most relevant to the topic. So we are seeing uh, a consciousness being raised uh, by a number of means uh, in various localities. But, Presiding Officer, when it comes to violence against women, we can have all the good intentions in the world, as with human rights, but unless there is a fundamental change in the ingrained culture, cultural attitudes, our real progress will not be made. The cornerstone of education has to be respect. It has to be the right to refuse to take part in activities which you don't want to take part in, and the right of respect for that decision. And until we actually allow that to happen, that becomes part of our education, particularly of young men, we will not make real progress you on this close, uh, very please. important human rights issue. Thank you very much. Now call on Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate. Uh, Minister, you have until five o'clock. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this has been a, a very good debate. A very, you, the Chamber is absolutely united in what we've been saying about violence against women, women and how we can tackle it and, and do more to, to stop it in our society. And I think that's important that we're all absolutely and should remain united in this. This is one issue above everything else, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that we should be absolutely united in. We've had very good contributions from around the Chamber with some of the, the more horrific ones like Graham Pearson when he started the debate in, in describing um, how he, you know, he had to attend a case of a woman that had been kicked to death. And I think for me, you know, that, that was quite... Um, just even thinking about that was quite horrific. And also the, the other... Uh, contributions we've had about the, the local agencies that are in all of our communities and the national organisations and how we can't tackle this without their support, how they're supporting our constituents and people on a daily basis. But what I would say is that the new, um, our new First Minister has made clear her commitment to tackling gender inequality and I certainly see violence against women as a cause and consequence of that inequality and I think uh, Alison Johnson also uh, uh, mentioned that. And it's not to say that men are not affected by domestic abuse, uh, as Mary Scanlon mentioned, or don't suffer the horrific experiences of it. But as we know, they do and will always work to ensure, this government will always work to ensure that male victims receive the support they need through our public and specialist services. And I would say to Mary Scanlon, we will always protect children who are in a family where there's domestic abuse. And I might say a bit more about that later. There is no uh, suggestion whatsoever that children, whether male or female, in a family um, where there's do domestic abuse are not going to get support and assistance from this government because it, it does impact on them for the rest of their lives, as I think uh, Mary Scanlon uh, pointed out. But we have to have a gendered analysis of violence against women in order to address it effectively. And we must work collaboratively with all our key partners to ensure that, that long and lasting change. And a number of uh, speakers in the debate uh, supported, and I welcome that, the, the implementation of Equally Safe Scotland's strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. Um, and I know there has been some concern from a number of people uh, about a delay in, in bringing this forward. We hope to take it to the next stage in, uh, early in the new year. But, you know, the government is very keen to ensure that we get the, arrange the arrangements right for this. It's ambitious and it's an important um, programme of work and we don't want to rush at it with speed. We've made progress in some of the early commitments and indeed I think the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary announced we'll be consulting very early next year on the new offences of proposed new offences of domestic abuse and revenge, revenge porn. I think Graeme Pearson uh, talked about, and someone else talked about, the delay in, in the court system. And we, of course we don't want to see delays in the court system. We are pleased that more people are coming forward. There are more people coming forward uh, that are subject to de domestic abuse now. They're being supported to come forward. The police are much more proactive in it and treat it much more seriously as, as well. But in saying that, we don't want to have unnecessary delays. Uh, the government had, has given the court system £1.4 million to try and uh, assist with the delays in the court systems. Uh, 
system and will continue to work with the agencies through the National Justice Board and Criminal Justice Board to, over, to, to monitor the overall levels of demand in that. But I think that's, that's important that, that we, re we do recognise there are more people coming uh, forward that are subject to um, domestic abuse. We've talked a lot about the organisations who work tirelessly to give the advice and support, and I think James Dornan, uh, Cara Hilton, Margaret McDougall mentioned organisations in their constituencies who work to give that absolutely essential advice and support to women and children who are at an extremely vulnerable point in their life. And sometimes it, the Scottish Government uh, contributes funding to these organisations. Um, we give um, funding of £34.5 million uh, for violence against women, and that's how important we treat it. But sometimes it's easy to forget the input the Scottish Government funding has on real families suffering violence and abuse, and certainly we, we, the agencies out there can tell us about it. But I, I, I was... Um, told of one survivor who has spoken of her experiences. And it's not always easy for people that have suffered uh, domestic abuse to speak about their experiences, um, but she wanted to speak about the support that she received from what she described as an amazing specialist service. Uh, and it's a woman who was experiencing domestic abuse uh, and she received support for herself and her children, and it was in Monkland's Women's Aid. And she said the service Women's Aid, in my opinion, has helped my boys to be children again. Instead of worrying all the time without this service, I don't think they would be the ha in the happy place they are now. And I think that tells us very much how we need these services. And I know there's been concern from a number of speakers um, about funding for the services. Um, we're currently at the ending of coming to the end of the spending review, and what's happening is officials are currently in discussion with the organisations about funding and the way ahead. We don't want to have any delays in that. We know there's uncertainty out there, but certainly um, we want to ensure that that's resolved as soon as we can and get that resolved. And the support services have many allies uh, in this chamber. For example, today we had Christina McKelvey and Malcolm Chisholm um, with their, their white, the Men's Against Violence, Women Against Men's Violence Against Women uh, group and the White Ribbon group and the Cross Party group. And I think today I was certainly pleased to, to go along there and see so many people from this chamber as I'm going in, meeting them all coming out in the corridor, who'd been in there to show their support for this, because I think it is important that this parliament leads on it. And but as we come to the end of 2014, I think this is a, a momentous year. It's made us all focus on what kind of Scotland we want for us and the next generation. And I believe that this debate actually cuts right to the heart of this. And I think Liam MacArthur and James Dornan uh, talked about the message. And I think the message from this parliament, as they mentioned, should be very loud and clear, and that violence against women is, it's never normal, it's never acceptable, it's never legal, and it should never, ever be tolerated or justified. And I think that's the united message we take today. Presiding officer, it's clear that all of us across this chamber want to see a Scotland where no one experiences abuse or violence, where no one is ever afraid to go home, or afraid of someone else coming home, where no young people have to hear or see their mother being abused. A Scotland where men and women are truly equal and where violence against women is finally a memory that's something in the past. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the debate on violence against women and it's now time to move to the next item of business which is decision time and there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 11695 in the name of Christine Graham on Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The motion is therefore agreed to. Second question is that Amendment 11789.1 in the name of Graham Pearson, which seeks to amend motion number 11789 in the name of Michael Matheson on violence against women, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to.
The third question is that motion number 11789 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended on violence against women be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The motion is therefore agreed to. And that concludes decision time and I now close this meeting of Parliament.